Okay. We're live. We're live. We're live. We're on. Same intro every week. Is that working? Is, is it, it on? Yet? Is it on yet? All good, Mick? Are you happy? Are all the colours and indications and everyone doing what they're meant to be doing? I think so. I don't know why, awesome. Why the, uh, why the audio seems so loud? Say hello, Dan. Hello. Hello indeed. Yeah, good. I'll do. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to TPS Live VCQ. Um, we are... It's Tuesday today. Yesterday was a public holiday. And we took the day off. Hooray. That was awesome. So hang out with our... Well, Dan with his family. Yeah. Me with my wife. I'm, I'm working on a, a, a jazz tune, Mick. Right. And I spent all day yesterday. Um, if you haven't heard this, it's, it's a tune called There Will Never Be Another You by Harry Warren. And it was the theme song from The World According to Garp. And it is the most incredible tune. Absolutely incredible. So I'm, I'm doing some... Some work on that at the moment, and it's got this amazing chord in it. it goes from a G major seven to a C sharp C sharp seven sharp eleven. Uh, sorry, C seven sharp eleven. So I'm I'm sort of wigging out on that at the moment. That's where I am at. <laughs> I I really struggle. You know, a lot of those old standards. Yeah. I really struggle to hear the tune. Oh, okay. Yeah, I find it really hard. Really, right. you know, so these great old songs. I'm like, just. Doesn't sound great to me. Sounds out of tune. You got, I guess you've got to go back, and there's so many versions of these recorded. Um, so, what was it? Was that was, uh, Nat King Cole uh, was the version I was listening to. Um, but yeah, a lot of those standards, there's been so, so many versions of them. And it's just, you know, they can be interpreted in so many different ways. Yeah. You know, so it's just finding the ones that you that you connect with. I even, I even find it difficult to, like, just sing the tune, though. Right. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, there we go. Yeah. Good. How are you get, so how are you getting on with it, Dan? Uh, I'm okay. I'm, I am trying to do a chord solo thing with it. Right. And I'm sort of taking my time and just trying to really understand the changes and, and, all, and inversions and stuff and trying to see where my brain will let my fingers go to but I just the, the, the tune brought me to tears um, yeah wonderful and and that's good wonderful wonderful every yeah happy I, tears every time I want to cry I uh, put a new record on <laughs> <laughs> oh dear oh dear Dan what was the long weekend in Adolf by the way do you know Mayday Mayday um Probably the bloody pagans, isn't it? Oh, right. Brilliant. Because they need a holiday. Yeah. I don't know what May Day's for. Is it Whitson? Is that it? Whitson? Yeah, there's a Whitson holiday, isn't there? I don't know. Anyway, um, if you are from the UK, you will be familiar. Welcome to the usual shambolic start to VCQ, where we just work yes. out if everything's working. I think we've uh, sussed that everything is working. Okay, good. Let us know if it's not, or if you have any trouble seeing or hearing us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, seems all right. Yes, David Clark, that's that's correct. It, that was a nine sharp 11, but it's got the, that dominant seven chord there, and then got the sharp 11 there, and I love that. In there, yeah, very good. Otherwise, it would be uh, here. Yeah, there you go. Just, uh, yeah, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Sorry, I'm done. No, it's. It, I find it. I find it genuinely fascinating. Um. Yeah. Uh, right. I was going to talk about May Day and Morris dancing. But I think we'd probably better just move on. I saw Morris Dancer's in frame. Yeah. Freaked me out. It's so weird. <laughs> it's an excuse to drink is what it is, I think. <laughs> anyway, if you're a Morris Dancer, apologies. No doubt when you get smashed on the ale and fall in the mulberry bush, all is well. 
<laughs> anyway, <laughs> hello, welcome to VCQ. It is me and it is him and we are here. And we say thank you to BV Ninja for being among us and among you and moderating on this fine sermon. Indeed. Um, oh, I just put fresh strings on. Oh, it's so nice. Here. It's the best. It's so nice. It's the best thing ever. The Texan Tyler says, good morning from Grapevine, Texas. Grapevine, Texas? Yes, yeah, so what should we call it? I don't know. What's that? A grapevine. Let's call it grapevine. That's like, that's the, the Australian school of thought. <laughs> yeah. It's a snake. It's uh, black, but it's got a red belly. Ah, a red belly black snake. That'll do. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, next to uh, Krusty Dog Poo. <laughs> do you remember Krusty Dog Poo? Doesn't exist anymore. Crusty dog poo. You don't see crusty white dog poo anymore. Um, uh, Michael B, let's start with you, Michael. Welcome everyone from around the world. Michael B says, is it true that some amps, maybe especially cheaper ones, don't take pedals well? I had a Blackstar HT20 that drove me mad trying to find drive pedals that work with it. I thought it was me. Interesting. It all depends on how the how the amp is voiced so if you've got an amplifier that's voiced to be crunchy at low volumes and they lack headroom then it can be really challenging what you what you might find though with those sorts of amps instead of using overdrive or distortion boosters to boost into that front end crunch can work really well um it there are some there are amps that we prefer with pedals, but every you, you can find pedals that will work generally with any amplifier, but sometimes it can be more challenging. Yeah, the, the we are all guilty of saying it, you know, is a good pedal platform, works well with pedals. There's really no such thing, but what it usually means is has enough headroom to take the pedal mm. so you can hear the pedal without the amp um, imparting a lot of, its, yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah. its thing. But of course, some of the um, some of our favourite guitar sounds down history are a pedal and an amp interacting. So f fuzz face Univi wouldn't doesn't sound like Jimmy unless it's into a cranked mm. overdriving Marshall. Yep. Um, you know, if you put it into the front of a nice Fender Twin, clean Fender Twin, it is a very different sonic experience. So takes pedals well, doesn't take pedals well. It's more about what you're trying to achieve and the coupling of the two. And the frustrating part of that is it costs a lot of money and loads of being disappointed to really learn what you like and what, what you like less. Because it'll be different from player to player yeah, as yeah. well. There's no yeah. hard and fast rule with it. Yeah. All depends on everything else that's going into it, your guitar, the way that you, you know, your attack. Yeah. Uh, and that will determine the things that you like, you know. One thing that's certainly worth trying is if you can't find, you know, if you are struggling a little bit and you've, let's say you've been used to using amp A, you acquire amp B and everything is different, as it would be. One thing to try is, you know, different ratios of gain and volume. It sounds like the most obvious thing in the world to mm. say, but some pedals really do sound different with their masters cranked. And the good news about an amp which has lower headroom is you can do that. Yeah. Because you won't get the crazy volume jump because the amp will go into overdrive so it won't be, you know, you won't get that huge great headroom thing. Yep. So try that, you know, if, if it's not quite responding how you like, try a different ratio of maybe you know, nowhere near as much gain as you thought you might want, mm. but loads and loads of volume, or vice versa, and yep. that might yield different results. The other thing as well, with the EQ and the amplifier, don't forget, that is a basically more gain, you know. So it might be that you start with the EQ turned off and then just get the EQ to a point where it's just on. If you need to control the gain in the app that way, um, you know, instead of having the EQ dimed, basically bypassing, you know, all the pots, start off with the EQ a bit lower and then just uh, let less through and maybe turn the amp up a bit. Yeah. And that, that's a nice way of controlling um, a bit of the gain staging in the amplifier. Indeed. Um, J2072 says, Mick, your acoustic sounded so great, I wondered what strings were on it. I just changed from 8020 bronze to phosphor bronze on my Santa Cruz FS and I'm loving the sound. How deep was your rabbit hole? <laughs> TPS is the mutts. Um, I use, yeah, I, I always get confused. The 8020s are the bright ones, right? Maybe. And the phosphor bronze are the less bright ones. I always get confused. Right. 
I like the less bright ones. Um, and I use the standard Kurt Mangan um, non-coated version thereof. I did use the Daddario ones for years, EXPs, and I've found them to be extremely stable, sounded great, lasted for ages, and were really brilliant. And then, because Dan and I do the, the Kurt Mangan signature set on the electrics, they sent us some acoustic ones to try. And all the things I like about the electric strings, I love about the acoustic strings. Really? Yeah, yeah. So a little bit less tension than I would get out of the um, Dario's. My Collings wants 13s on it. Wow. But they're just a bit too much for me, if I'm honest. If I'm not gig fit, I really struggle. So I need a set of 12s. Um, yeah, and they just work really well. So thank you for that. A um, couple of hours playing on them usually. Pack it fresh. They can mm. be nice for zingy stuff, but you want a couple hours on them. Mm. If you if you want to try something different again, I'd heartily recommend the Monel strings. Um, I think Martin used to call them retro or something, but they're um, bluegrass players like them, mandolin players like them, and it's um, a nickel alloy rather than a phosphor bronze type alloy. Right. And they look like electric guitar strings. Right. So you think, well, they'll never work with, you know, they won't they won't work on the acoustic guitar. But they're really cool, really cool sound. Wow. They go off pretty quick and then they stay there. Monel, M O N E L. Anyway. Cool. Um. Okay, Jacob Bartelt. Hello, Jacob. Um, and thanks for all your comments. We see them in the in the thing each week. Um, he says, hi guys, I just got my Future Factory, Free the Tone Future Factory, and I want to know how you guys set yours up. Also, what's a good sub for the CXM78 if we can't afford it? <laughs> the Universal Audio. Well, it does seem to be so far, doesn't it? Yeah, but I'm saying if you can't afford this, the... the um, I guess, the, well, the Universal Audio is cheaper, but it's Less still really, half the price. really expensive. Less than half the price, isn't it? Um, yeah. Are they two nine nine? No. Or are they three nine nine? No, no, they're they're four hundred. Oh, are they? Yeah, okay. yeah. Right, Fu um, future factory. It's on your board, isn't it? My pedal board. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it let you into a little secret. I use the presets it comes with. Mm. And they're great. Um, and just yeah, tweak them. The things that I change. One of the if you're if you've you know you're presented with a future factory for the first time, you're like, oh my god, where do I start with this? A really great thing to do, there's a couple of switches on there that enable you to mute either delay A or delay B. And you can do that and you can hear what delay A and delay B are doing in the presets. Mm. Secondly, um, so my favourite one I think is preset one, the one that is the 500 and whatever milliseconds. Right. I think one's got a little bit of modulation on it. I always turn the mix down a bit. The mix is always too high in delay for me. Mm. Um, which you can do because you've got those global controls top left. Um, so it's a really easy tweak and you can save that if you want. Um, but yeah, turning each one of those delays on, uh, muting each one in turn will let you hear what each one's doing. And I love that. I also love preset three, which I think is the chorus one. Right. Oh, yeah. And going through the presets and sort of deconstructing them is a mm. really good way to learn the pedal. Yeah. Yeah, one of the great things about that pedal is the the filter and being able to, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, filter the the repeats, and the way that you can filter the bottom end off that, and the character that gives, is yeah, is magic. But there's something magic about the the preamp mm. in that pedal, and it just everything sounds so present and clear, and it's I mean very uh, twenty two ninety in that respect, you yeah, know, yeah, just yeah. so clear and um, doesn't seem to, you know, keeps everything intact, keeps your original signal intact, doesn't colour everything too much. Yeah, it's be really beautiful, really beautiful. If you're not using it in stereo, I don't know if it would default to this mode because that's how you insert the jacks, but remember to change the dual delays to series, not to stereo. Yeah. Unless it does sum to mono. Well, you, yeah, it will sum to mono. Does and then, it? Then you've got the dual delays in parallel. Yeah. But Do, does it sum to mono in parallel? It, yeah, it does. Ah, okay, yeah, fair yeah. enough. I didn't know that. Um, less expensive alternative to the CXM. Um, the Source Audio... Collider. Well, yeah, I was going to say the Ventress, because that's the, that's the reverb, isn't it? The Ventress is great. The Ventress is great, but the Collider... For me, 
I is just it's my favourite source audio pedal. They've done such a great job with that thing. Yeah, and obviously you've got all the delays in there as well. Yeah. So if you wanted some different delays that you weren't getting out of your Future Factory, um, but you know, coming down from that, any of the of the more sort of accessible digital reverbs will do a decent plate. Um, the 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 Hall of Fame. Yeah, TC Hall player. of Fame, Boss RV6. You yeah. know, we always forget about the Boss RV6. The only thing, well, not the only thing, the, the key thing with uh, the Chase Bliss is the ability to change those reverb times depending on frequency. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's possible to do via something like, you know, the, the TC Tone Print Editor. Yeah, not sure. Um, do check because the thing that makes the CXM so cool as we just said is the ability to have those different delay times at different frequencies yeah is it is it time or is it depth uh, it's the it's the feedback yeah. isn't it yeah yeah so you can basically go I want more sort of treble reverb and less bass reverb and you can affect the crossover and point exactly that's that's yeah. the big thing yeah plus you've got those um, high and lo-fi modes and you've got the um, various diffusion um, variables on the tank, so and the modulation, modulation essentially, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so if if you figure out what the what the CXM seventy eight can actually do and why it's so cool, look for some of those features, editable features. That might be another good reason to look at the Source Audio because their app um, for sound editing is really really good mm. usually gives you a whole ton of parameters so yeah but i'm you know goodness me i'm sure there's plenty of other cool ones out there yeah some great stuff the the rooms by death by audio yeah is a stellar bonkers thing isn't stellar it? reverb yeah um some really great sounds of that really creative thing um you know the uh Warus audio the fathom yeah beautiful yeah, so yeah. there's some really great, really clever things out there. If yeah, you... and don't forget the big, you know, um, oh. Strymon Blue Sky and Big Sky. Of course, those ones. i tell you what, it's an awesome reverb. If an you... XR M300. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> so this is the Supernatural reverb. Let me just... Let's see a pack of the light. There we go. Oh, look at that. So, uh, old Digitech Supernatural Reverb. If you can find one. If you can find one. Um, but they, they do come up. And the all the algorithms are by Lexicon. And it really does sound great. Now, it's not analog dry through, um, but saying that, it does sound really good. Um, yeah, and I used it for a while, and the yeah, it really does sound superb. Uh, good luck, Jacob. Indeed. Uh, Alexandre Bilodeau. Uh, he says, Hey guys, I have the full tone Deja Vibe Mark II, the white one, and it sounds a bit thin to my ears. Lots of high end. Is there a vibe that stays fuller in the frequency range? Lots of love from Canada. I think you've got a buffer issue, is what's going on here. Because mm. it doesn't um, it depends what you've got I'm guessing here's my guess you've got something like a reverb or a delay or something after it because what I found with mine is that it gets super fizzy when you've got a strong buffered pedal after it yeah I it, it could be a strong buffer pedal before it as well like, yeah. like we had in the show Try, if you haven't done this, just try putting it in front of everything, including fuzz. Just give it a go. Yeah. And you might find that's, that solves that problem. But also just remove it. Remove everything else from your signal chain and plug it. Plug your guitar in and straight into your amp. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you find the problem persists and it's still too bright for you, um, yeah, have a look at the Jam Pedals RetroVibe Mark II. It's mm -hmm. really good. Um, Wonderful. Basically, any of the ones we looked at last week. Uh, the Dry Bell. Dry Bell's a great shout. Vibe machine is excellent. Yeah, because you can tweak that. You can also tweak the impedance on the Dry Bell as well. It's super, yeah. super tweakable. Yeah, so do that. You know, um, process of elimination. Take all your other pedals out of the chain. Because even if you think, 
another pedal isn't um, affecting it, it may well be that something in your on your pedal board isn't true bypass and it actually is affecting it badly. And the effect of buffers on those things is just massive. Are you double teeing? Yes. That's impressive. Um, sorry, mate, I didn't... I... No, it's fine. To be honest, last week I had a tea and for the last hour I was... Dying. Oh, you should take a bath. You take a comfort break if you need one. Don't you? No, it's no, it's good. It's good because I've just I've I've had my I have I've had my comfort break. Yeah. Imagine um, if uh, imagine if there were some nice reverb tanks printed on cups that you could buy from I a love that store. Cup. It'd be it's good, great. Wouldn't it? It'd be brilliant if you could do that. This was a misprint. I saw that. Yeah. Um. Travis Crown, hello from Richmond, Virginia. When you two legends talk about pickups, show my man Lindy Fralin some love. He's from Richmond, Richmond, Virginia too. His pickups are world renowned. Yeah, we, I, we sh we th I think every time we talk about pickups, we mention Lindy Fralin because we're both big fans of Lindy's. Yeah, you do. Uh, I think I, I don't think I've ever had any. Weirdly, it's interesting because you know Lindy Fralin is the first wave of boutique pickup makers, isn't he? Yes. And um, there are Lindy's in here. I think these sound these sound great. I've had a I've had a realization today with pickups. Well, not a realization, but I've made a decision today about pickups. Go on. Unless I am changing the guitar, I'm never buying. I'm never buying a guitar that I'm not happy with as it is. Right. That's I've put. So I had some. Um, Ron Ellis pickups in this guitar, and they sound, they're, of course, they're amazing. But I've just gone, I'm going to put the originals back in. And the Ron Ellis was actually making this guitar sort of compete with Red a bit. Yeah. Whereas I put these in, and they're really weak and softer sounding. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's like, oh, okay, that's the sound of a 65 yeah. telly, you know. So I've made a decision that I am just. If I ever, any other guitars that I get, I I love it, and that'll be that. Unless it's something like I, I've done with um, uh, Carl, and we're completely changing that guitar and putting some wide range humbuckers in, but I'm I'm done retrofitting different sorts of pickups and you're done with it. It's just it's such a rabbit hole. Yeah, it's yeah. such a rabbit hole. Yeah, so. it, it is often thankless. I mean, th there is a, definitely a case to be made for cheap guitars, totally, and, and good pickups. There's a case to be made for that. But a hundred percent expensive guitars and splitting the fag paper is is a thankless task, it isn't it? Yeah. Interestingly it enough, uh, my good chum Dan Drive, Dan Kerner, um, and his friend. Oh, whose name escapes me just for a second because we don't know one another. I'll remember in a minute. Um, Till, I think his name is, um, have very kindly got me a set of Andreas Klopman's pickups. Right. And for anyone who knows Strat pickups, knows that, you know, Klopman is, he's up there. Right. Uh, in, in renown anyway, in reputation. And they sent them to me and Dan said, you just got it. You have to hear them. You have to hear them. So... It, that might be my last foray with blue. Just to go, I'll stick them in. I'll have a listen. Yeah, right. And all the rest of it. But in, there's two two things that piqued my interest about that. It's less about the pickups, which I'm sure are amazing because you know modern boutique pickups made by someone who cares about what they're doing are going to be good, right? And whether they're better or worse than anyone else's is really a point of personal preference at that point. Totally. But there's two things that piqued my interest. One is. It's got the aluminium guard underneath. Yeah, right. Which I've never had, but of course all vintage strats have. Two, well, all vintage strats of that period have. Um, two, non-RWRP. Yes. And that really, really, really interests So me. what that means is in the in-between positions two and four, it's not hum cancelling. Uh, and I'm, I am so interested to hear that because I've never not heard that. Yeah, I've never not heard the the hum cancelling, and it does make sense that you are 
something would be missing. Well, interestingly enough, what's the best sounding strap in this room at the moment, Dan? Is the old one here? Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, RWRP? Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, right. Because they didn't do that. No. Yeah, right. So this, I mean, is hands down the best sounding strap I've ever had or, you know, had the pleasure to enjoy. Yeah. It's a Refin 61 that was uh, on loan to me from a guy named Simon Green. I'm actually taking it back on Thursday. Simon's going to have it back for a little while. Right. Just to see if he can rebond with it. Okay. And I should be very sorry to see it not here, but at the same time, you know, Simon's guitar. <laughs> yeah, of course. And uh, he's going to have it back and, and have a play on it. Um, it's an astonishing sounding thing. It is. Yeah, totally. RWRP? Don't yeah. think so. Wheat no. pickups? Yes. Yeah. Made in 1961? Yes. And it's not just in there, is it? It's so not. I'll never forget turning up to film one day and I was stood outside the door thinking that is the best guitar sound I've ever heard in my life. And it came in and you do it that and with <laughs> that into a fuzz into the two rock. <laughs> it is pretty good. But it's you incredible. know, let's um, let's raise a clap for Transit Van oh, that loud. sounded good. Doesn't Transit, I was just saying it was loud. Yeah. It was, you know, that guitar turned up is an absolute monster. Yeah, but Transit Van? Sounded good in Friday's video? Sounded fantastic. Yeah. If you don't know why it's called Transit Van, um, inspired by Billy Gibbons' uh, Pearly Gates, the, the, go and read the story about Pearly Gates. It's to do with a Packard car that they traded, I think, or that broke down and was left. And they thought the car had divine inspiration and it was involved in the acquisition of Billy's 59 Les Paul. And as a result, they called the Les Paul Pearly Gates. I went to pick that guitar up in a long wheelbase Transit Van. Therefore, that shall be its name. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, Travis Crown. Hello, Travis. He says, hello from... Oh, no, we just had Travis. Apologies. Um, Jacob Bar Bartelt. Jacob Bartelt, again, says, hi again. I've got a Fender Surf Green Strat, 60s reissue, Mexican made with a maple neck. What upgrades would you suggest? I love mixed strap for reference. Um, not necessarily any, Jacob, to be honest. Um, get it set up nice, get that bridge working as you want it to, as you want it. Um, I don't know if, if you find the bridge pickup a bit spiky and it hasn't already been done, one very easy mod is to move the wire that comes from the second tone pot. It attaches to the switch and to control the middle pickup. You can move that wire to control the bridge pickup just mm. by moving it one lug. Um, and having the tone control on the bridge pickup can really help. That's a great mod. If you find it a bit spiky sounding, if you don't, don't worry about it. After that, if if the guitar isn't really, you know, if you like the sound of it and enjoy playing it, no need to mod it. Mm. Obviously pickups is always an option. Um, and then the world is your lobster. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. Cool guitar. What a cool guitar. Um, Doink. Oh, Travis again. Hello, Travis. Orange fur coat, jam fuzz phrase, light speed, Hampstead Odyssey, Ripley Fall, a reverb, jam rattler, hot cake, plumes, belly pop deluxe. Which order? Oh my god. Far <laughs> out. Um, reverb last. You've got too many overdrive pedals. Disagree. I think you have almost the right amount of overdrive pedals. Fuzz phase first. Yeah. Reverb last. Belly pop deluxe second last. Nice. And then pick and choose after that. Doesn't really matter. Just remember with the gain stages, a good place to start is with the least, the pedal that you're using with the least amount of gain is at the end of the gain, and the pedal that you're using with the most amount of gain is at the front, except for, and there are obviously exceptions to this rule, except for if you're using fuzz, you're going to have that right at the front because you want your guitar to see the input of the fuzz. Connect the coil to the base of the transistor. There you are. 
And if you want more on that, watch Friday's video, the one just gone. Yes. We talked a lot about that. Yes. Uh, that was fascinating, actually, wasn't it? Having the swapping the fuzz and the vibe around, and what the impedance change did to the gain. Vibe, fuzz, fuzz, vibe, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, that's a Tommy Cooper gag, just in case you didn't get it then. I was Macarena ring. Ah, hey, Macarena. Hey. hey. Um, <laughs> I've never actually been to Ibiza or Falaraki or anywhere like that. You know, on a, one of those holidays where you you sort of sober up to. Oh, that's that's any any wedding DJ or oh, right. any Christmas party. Okay. You know, um, when Santa comes out and gets on the decks, that's probably the first thing he's going to play. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> dim, dim, dim. Anyway, <laughs> my man usually comes and gets me when the DJ starts. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Taylor, this way. Yes, this way, please, sir. Um, what were we talking about? Can't remember. Uh, Sean Chun. Hello, Sean. He says, I just got Fender's Broadcaster reissue. How very cool. Very nice. Um, it's been my dream guitar ever since I first started playing because it was on Jesus Just Left Chicago and all the early Tom Petty uh, stuff. What were the dream guitars of teenage Mick and Dan and why? Oh... Uh, my first dream guitar was probably a gem, which I ended up getting. Um, I just remember seeing the, I was, I was that kid who would buy a guitar magazine and then every page in that guitar magazine would become a poster on the, my wall. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I just remember the images of when that came out and it just it blew my mind, and I ordered the I ordered the floral, the black floral one. Of course, what turned up was the bright yellow one, um, desert yellow they called it. Yeah. Uh, but that was, I just thought it was the most astonishing guitar. But after that, um, when I played my first vintage nineteen sixty four Strat, oh man, I'll never forget this. It was the early mid nineties, yeah, ninety three, ninety four. And it was 1964, and it had a fret, frets had been changed, and that was it. And it was five grand Australian. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't afford it. And I remember sitting in the music store, and I was playing stuff way beyond what I should be playing, because the guitar was, I was just that connected to it. Just, no, just couldn't, no. So I'd, I'd... Time to put it back in the yeah, case, Dan. Yeah, yeah. Not today, well, so I had to let it, let it go. But then I ended up getting an a L-series track, which was stolen. Yeah. But anyway, that was my it was first of the gem, then a vintage Strat. Strat for me, I think, by the time I was a teenager, um, Clapton was probably my number one guy, and then I discovered Stevie Ray Vaughan. Wow. Clapton was playing Strats at the time. It was in his, um, just as he was doing the signature Strat, I guess. Ace. Who introduced you to that music? Uh, Where did you hear it? Um, uh, Two things, both both via my dad. Uh, actually, three. My mate Paul Stevenson, who ended up, we played in bands together for years. He had a video recorder and we used to practice around his house. And he had VHS videos of like Clapton at the Albert Hall and Dire Straits. Oh, wow. And stuff like that. So that definitely. Um, secondly, my dad, uh, massive music and guitar fan not a guitar fan as such but a massive music fan mm. and two things one we would go to our local pub and watch the blues bands play mm -hmm. and i watched a guy called marco rossi who lives in weymouth in dorset marco is just an exceptional player turns out he's mates with robbie mcintosh we all meet later on in life and wow yeah, yeah, anyway, um, and Marco's just this astonishing player. The first time I ever saw him play, he had a Strat with a mid-boost circuit and a Fender concert, 4x10, and he played T-Bone Shuffle. Wow. And I must have been 13 or 14, something like that. I was like, yes, nice. that's what I want to do. Nice. And then separately, I discovered Stevie Ray, not sure how, um, and my dad's mate at work was so worried that I was going to become a Stevie Ray Vaughan freak 
he made me a compilation tape of other kinds of blues. Oh, and it had seriously? People, it had people like Snooks Eaglin on it. And, um, wow. Well, it actually had that uh, showdown version of T-Bone Shuffle by um, Albert Collins and Johnny Copeland and Robert Cray. Had some Robert Cray on it, had some Captain Beefheart on it. Mm. And that was kind of a boo. Mm. Oh, hello. So that's how. Anyway, before, it was a strat, just, strat. I just remember before the gem, there was, I was uh, in Brisbane and there was this music store. I cannot remember the name of it. You go downstairs to the guitars, the pianos were upstairs, you go downstairs to the guitars. And in the, the case, which no one was allowed to touch, were these three Charvel guitars. Uh. And in the middle was this ice blue Charvel black pointy headstock. And I just, it, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> yeah. So you were pointy. Yeah, I definitely never I was Well, I was Floyd Rose more than anything. I yeah. just saw that and, I, and I, all the stuff was like, and there are, there are songs that um, we wrote and recorded when I was 16 and it sounds like there's fire trucks going off. Yeah. You know, it's... <laughs> Dan's got a whammy bar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Here's Sean again. Um, Sean Churney says, Dan, can you explain what the resistors in my stack knob jazz bass do, please? Nope. I don't, what, I don't know. Big guitar. Who knows? <laughs> Big um, guitar. It'll be to do with the tone uh, stack. Is it active? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's going on the circuit. So in a jazz, uh, stack knob means concentric pots. And let me guess. One of them does volume, one of them does tone. That would, wouldn't be unusual. Or if it's an active circuit, it's got a battery in it, it might be that one does bass and one does treble. Right. I've seen that before in some dual concentric pots. Okay. Other than that, don't know. It, yeah, so resistors in a passive circuit, uh, you might get, if, you're, if you've got a treble bleed circuit, you can have a resistor in series with a capacitor. Uh, you can, uh, or in parallel, that's another way to do it. Um, it might be that it's, unless there's a switch that you're switching in to have a different, uh, I'm, so one, one mod that I did, I found this, I found the, the perfect sweet spot just down a little bit. So I had a little switch put in an old guitar that I could just switch it in yeah. and leave the guitar full on. I just switch it up and that would take me to the to the um, perfect rollback thing. Then I realised I could just do this. Didn't need the switch. <laughs> hey. Could be triple was more, was more issue trying to find the switch than it was just rolling yeah. back the volume. <laughs> could be a treble bleed. Yeah, if, well, you'd need the capacitor in there for treble bleed, but the, this, the resistor might be part of a treble bleed circuit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Phil Sherry. Oh, here we go. I thought we were going to get this. Dear Soccer Dads. <laughs> well, hey. Well, hey! How do you feel about being referred to as such in the pedal movie? I thought it was a bit disrespectful. Get Juan on to apologise. Uh, look, Juan's a legend and, <laughs> they, you know, it's said in jest. It's... <sighs> and even if it wasn't said in jest, it's fine, isn't it? I mean, I good. think it's fair, you know, if you take... First of all, let's say, uh, let's wish Juan Alderete um, all the best in his recovery. Yes, indeed. Uh, after he did that interview, not connected to, but anyway, <laughs> he did the interview before he had a really bad bike accident. Mm. And um, he hit his head. He had a really serious brain injury and he's been recovering ever since. And his wife, Anne, posts on um, their Just Giving page... Uh, to sort of help with his recovery and convalescence. And apparently he's re he's recovered in a huge way. Oh, wow, brilliant. Um, but he's still obviously Out not, not to where he was before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Juan Alderete, we hope you're doing okay. Yeah, and uh, if you want to check out his Just Giving page, it's on justgiving.com and um, that will help out with, with his recovery. Mm -hmm. Aside from all of that, um, it's fine, isn't it? I mean, you know. Nice to be mentioned. If you take in the cultural sort of gap between us and the USA and maybe cool alternative musicians and me and Dan, then yeah, we probably are soccer dads. <laughs> Except that neither of us like soccer and I don't have any kids, but apart from that, 
It's all good. Yeah, yeah, it is all good. Yeah. It's, it's fine, isn't it? I think the world's got bigger problems than uh, us being shooed in the balls by a pedal movie. <laughs> I kind of like it, actually. I, I, I've got to admit that being on the edge of that whole world is, is a place I've always enjoyed being. Right. Like, as... Uh, when we got to the end of the guitar mag, when I got to the end of my guitar magazine days, mm. I just felt like I was in this inward-facing bubble of industry. Right. Okay. That I just didn't like very much. Sure. And it's not to say we don't like the pedal makers. Of course we do. We we love we love, you know, anyone who's passionate about what they do, do and they do it in an artistic manner. Of course we love those people. Of course we do. And mm. we're privileged to be able to get some insight and you know have the the benefit of their counsel on things, but. As opposed to being in a kind of a gang, a club, um, I'm definitely with Groucho Marx on that. Yeah. I, if you don't know the quote, I don't want to be in any club that would have me as a member. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very so, good. So, yes, we send all our love to Juan Alderete. And um, uh, actually, we did get a little e email from somebody at Reverb going, oh, God, we're really sorry. We think this was uh, maybe a bit poorly considered, but... It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Please go and watch the pedal movie. I'm sure it contains lots of really amazing stuff. Yeah. I need to wait till it's free on YouTube because I don't want to give that corporation any more money. Fair enough. They're owned by Etsy, just in case you don't know Reverb. Are they? Yeah. Huge money. They've got more money than God. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I had no idea. Oh, yeah. Great site, though. Bought loads of stuff off there. We bought that off Reverb. Yeah, no, it is. There's some really, really great, really good stuff on there. Is that catty enough at the end? Yeah. Wow. Um, anyway, thanks for asking the question, Phil. And uh, yeah, helping friendly. Well, that's good, isn't it? First time super chat, long time fan. When I practice, I want to practice at gig volume, but I feel my technique is more comfortable unplugged. How can I get over such loudness overwhelming my technique? What a great question. It's a great question because everything changes at volume. One thing that Mick and I have at, at pains to point out, and anyone that's practised on their own, they've gone to the band practice or gone to the gig, you'll realise that at volume everything changes. So yeah, it yeah. is absolutely crucial that you practise at volume. You get to understand how your guitar reacts at volume because yeah, yeah. it's a different instrument. I'm the opposite. I can't actually play quietly. Yeah, to absolutely. True, true story, because um, everything that you're required to do at volume doesn't work, has no effect at, at low volume. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there are people who would find that ridiculous because, you know, if you learn to play the guitar properly, surely it's just, you know, playing the right stuff, putting your fingers in the right place and playing the stuff you should be playing. But it just doesn't work like that in no, rock and roll. Not with volume. guitar, absolutely. It's rock and roll, baby. Yeah, and it, the guitar does a whole bunch of different stuff at yep. volume. So um, to your question, how can you get over? It's a tough one because if you decide you want to get over it, a lot of that stuff that's in your technique for playing quietly may well go away mm. because you don't need it anymore. Yeah. Or at least it doesn't work loud. And I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not like you're putting down the guitar and picking up the saxophone. It's not a completely different thing but it is a, a, a modified skill set. Or it might be that if you just do it more, it's a skill set that you can draw on. Yeah. And you can go, I'm playing loud now, therefore I need to do this. But yeah, it is a shock uh, when it happens. I think we need to discuss this a bit more. What, one really important thing I would say, as soon as you start to turn up, turn the gain in your overdrives down. Yeah. Uh, because what will happen at volume, that, that level of gain, suddenly everything becomes so microphonic and so sensitive that any little movement is just like so loud. Um, I remember we were, I was in on holiday with the family in Cornwall and there was a band getting ready to set up and the guitar player, who's obviously been playing quietly for most of his rehearsals, turned up and it just fed back as soon as the volume control on the guitar was up, it was just feeding back. And you could see the manager was getting really annoyed. And I, he had the gain on his amplifier, like, cranked. And I just wanted to go up and say, hey, can we just, just turn that down? It'll still be loud. It'll still be great. 
Um, so yeah, be super aware of where your gain is set because it'll at volume, it'll be very different. Your amplifier is going to be doing a lot of that work, a lot of that limiting. So you'll, you'll find that you don't need the gain set anywhere near as high when you're playing at volume. It's true. It is true. It is true. You can let the guitar do uh, do the work, which is another great point of learning. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, um, book a rehearsal studio for yourself. And just turn so you're not there with anyone else and you can make as much noise and, and, and get to grips with that volume um, and then you don't have to be self-conscious of anything. Yeah. That's, I When I was living in Mackay, I rented a um, steel container, like a steel container office space. And I'd just go there, you know, every day or every couple of days, had my old Marshall JMP. And I just turn the thing up and stand in front of it and make <laughs> glorious noises. It was wonderful. <laughs> it is wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm going to turn Super Chat off because we we won't get through them all. So I'm going to turn it off and we'll we'll finish the ones that have come in. Um, but I'm going to turn it off now, everyone. So please, no more Super Chat. Um, any that have been made up to this point, we will answer. Um, have we done Albus Band yet? Uh, I will get us back there, Daniel, okay. and let let us know where we are. We got loads. We have got loads. Oh we have got loads. Okay, it's like getting through them. Um, this, I mean, all these things are so interesting to talk about, and we can just. As you well know, we can take anything like this and just go on about it for ages because it is really interesting. But we, yeah, we'll try and tighten up and with the answers. <laughs> we'll try. It's not going to work. Um, I Freeman, or Ill Freeman, one says, "I'm trying to get that D'Angelo, Isaiah Sharkey, cool, jazzy R&B sound. I'm a beginner. What pedals would you suggest?" D uh, d uh, far out, man. That sound is, it's all in the playing. It is just extraordinary. Yeah, I'm trying to, I mean, I'm not sure which record you're talking about specifically. Um, I'm pretty sure I hear a phaser in some of that stuff. Mm. Um, but more than that, it's just a really nice, often a really lovely clean guitar sound. Mm. With a bit of the tone rolled off. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't say what guitar you've got, but um, try, just to begin with, and this isn't you know necessarily the, the way to do it, but just try. If you've got a telly, for example, go to the middle position. If you've got something right. like a Gibson with two humbuckers, go to the middle position. Yeah. Strat, middle pickup, or positions two and four. But the middle pickup, it just seems to be a place where soul and funk really lives. Mm -hmm. Um, take a little bit of tone off using the tone pot into a fairly clean sound and just get to work on your chords. Yeah, good shout. Um, I hear a lot of the legacy of lots of the classic. It's sort of, it, it's a, this beautiful crossroads of funk and jazz, mm. the guitar playing in that kind of music. Yeah. And it's, it's a mercurial because it's always, it's often a bit more complex than you might think. Um, but that will that will get you started and mm. get your chords down. Wah Wah is always pretty good. Listen to um, one one cool sound to chase down in that genre is if you listen to a guitar player called Wah Wah Watson. Two Wahs. <laughs> but if you add a delay pedal to that and you do the wah and the delay and you... you Experiment with some of those textures. Yeah. You can make like raking down the strings. That was a wah wah Watson trick, and uh, wah wahing it and letting the delay do the rest. That can be really good fun. You hear that in a lot of soul and funk music. Yep. Um, yeah. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I don't know any more than that. I don't know much about Isaiah actually, but um, yeah. Listen to some Ronnie Jordan as well. What's the What's the name? Uh, someone in the Family Band. Uh, oh, I was talking to you about it the other day. Um, uh, oh, Robert Randolph. Robert Randolph and the Family Band. 
Yeah, I mean, he's a lap steel player. He is, but the but the sound of those albums yeah, yeah. Um, has got a lot of that sort of dynamic in it, and it's ah, oh, it's just glorious. It's good just stuff. just glorious. Yeah, you got to be able to sit back and yeah, play the chords. You know, <laughs> it's just yeah. Also, listen to some Parliament and P Funk. <laughs> yeah, rubber band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the oh, yeah, it's all that stuff. Good luck. Have fun. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Wade Summer says, new guitar day. I've got an Epiphone Les Paul 59. Nice. Just waiting for UPS. Thanks for all you do, guys. Helping educate a guy who took a 30-year hiatus from playing after being a music major at college. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, congratulations. You, well done, mate. Enjoy that guitar as yeah, well. Yeah, brilliant. There's nothing like it, is there, a new guitar day? No, my brother got had a new guitar day today. What he, he bought? bought? It's, he bought a, an old, like a 20-year-old reissue of the... Um, the Fender custom dual 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 wide range humbucker. Oh yeah, okay. That one, thin yeah. line. The thin line. Yeah. Um. So. What yes. colour? Natural ash. Black. Oh right. Yeah. So it's got that. I've said they're great guitars. They're not the original uh, Cunefe pickups. pickups and yeah. you know stuff. Um. But they're 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 great. Cool. Yeah. He's nice. very excited. I think because he came here. And then he's like, he saw the amount of guitars that we had, and he's, I think he's sort of taking that on as a challenge. So every couple of weeks, he's going, look what I got. <laughs> it does get that way with guitars a bit, doesn't it? It does. Um, Albus Band, Aaron. Hey, man, how hey, are you? Mate. He says, why, hello, you legends. I just wanted to let Mick know I've nicked one of his licks and turned it into a four-bar jam. Four-bar jam, all my love. Um, I, I nicked him off someone, Aaron, so um, that's all good. Yep. Someone nicked one of my legs, turn it into a seven and a half bar jam. <laughs> Excellent. Well done, mate. Thank you. So Digby Chicken Caesar says, any thoughts on an overdrive for a Clapton cream tone? I have a Marshall 18 watt clone, but it's still too loud to turn up. Peace and love. Yes, I've got the answer for you, Sonny Jim. Oh, let me use my incredible powers of deduction. Oh, yeah, of course. Hide your eyes, Dan. Good man. <laughs> Hide your eyes. Hide your eyes. Are the cameras further away than it normally is? Uh, Thorpey Warthog. Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. In case you didn't get that, the Thorpey Warthog. It's just the most magic crossover between distortion and fuzz. And you mm. can get it a bit fuzzy around the edges if you want. It's just a brilliant, brilliant distortion sound. Um, it has a tone pot, which I believe works in reverse, like a tone cut on a box amp. Oh, okay. I think I could have that completely wrong. Anyway, um, I would thoroughly, thoroughly recommend that. And if that's out of your price range, um, Be interested to know what 18 watt clone you've got. I've got a, I've got one of those, and they're such great amplifiers. Um, what else is good? Uh, I mean, you can do it with most fuzzes, but that can end up a bit aggressive. Mm. Um, yeah, go for the warthog. It's yeah, such a great pedal. It is extraordinary. I mean, it, what what you're what what you're trying to avoid is tube screamer, IC type overdrives. I think. Mm. Um, and more transistor based, harder harder edges. Yeah. yeah. So I, I mean that very well may may well be an op amp based one. I don't know what the circuit looks like, but um, you're you're you want something that's got some some life around the edge. You know, it's not compressed tube screamer type overdrive mm. overdrive with that particular EQ curve. You need some bass and you need some treble. You a need rat to, uh, might work as well. Yes, actually rat's a really good shout. Mm. Yeah. As long as you don't set it in the kind of really mid cut metal yeah, yeah. place. There's some nice nice things of that. Um Yes. Uh any yeah. Oh. Zvex box of rock. Um, I'm just looking at what's on the uh, the Fender Pugilist Distortion. We'll do it. I'm looking at, at what's on our shelves. Yeah, right. Um, is a really really nice um, 
Benson overdrive. Yeah, the Benson will do it. Not a huge amount of gain in it, but... Um, Mythos Super Cabra. Ah, there you go. With a step towards Billy Gibbons. Is yeah, is. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... Oh. Yeah, yeah. Just not a Tube Screamer. Or a Boss BD2. <laughs> Good luck. Chris Allen. Hi, Chris. Thanks for all the info and inspiration. I've just built my first pedal board, topping it off with a Keeley Fuzzbender. Have you tried it? Any tips or tricks? Fuzzbender is wonderful. Um, it is... It's got really powerful EQ on it. And you can basically make that work in, like, most amplifiers. Yeah. So just be sensitive as to how you, you set the, the EQ. Um, but, yeah, no, just have at it. If it sounds good, it is good. Yeah, if you're new to fuzz, um, what you'll find is, and I, I apologise in advance if this is too simplistic, but what you'll find if you're new to fuzz is, it all sounds really woolly and horrible down here, but actually that woolly and horrible stuff gets important when you play single notes. So mm. for those really fuzzy, awesome, you know, solo-y type stuff, you need all the, you need it all up there. But if you try and get too much definition on the bottom strings, it can sound really weird. So when you play low, try and keep your notes clean and don't bother with stuff like chords or power chords, unless what you want is mush. But to avoid the mush, keep your low notes clean and preferably to single notes, and then enjoy that singing high sustain. Uh, yeah, but if you treat it like an overdrive and you're trying to play brown sugar with fuzz on, it just doesn't really, doesn't really work. Although it would be an interesting... <laughs> <laughs> An interesting version. Um, congrats on the first board. Jason Indeed. Hogan says, I'm about to buy my first Strat, also my first single coil. Wow. I know the main thing is going by feeling connected with the guitar, but also, are there any Strat-specific quirks I should be aware of when comparing Strats? Obviously, you're going to answer this. Yep. The well, first one I'm going to say is, if you're used to playing humbuckers, the, probably the first thing that's going to happen when you pick up the strat, you're going to plug it in and you go, hmm, it's a bit, uh, what's going on? It's Where's bit, the guitar going? Yeah, yeah, it's a bit quiet. <laughs> um, at volume, it will become a sledgehammer. Yeah. They do need to be played a bit louder, strats, I think. Yeah. Or, put another way, they do need a, some dynamic help at sure. low volume because what you've got is that really massive attack and then dies away quite quickly mm. it's just sort of dynamic nature of a strat and that's been solved many ways over the years you know people put humbuckers in them or or what but um you've said it pick up a few if you have the luxury to do so given everything that's going on um and just find one that you like the feel of and then work with it that's that's always the hardest thing, you know, if you're used to playing one type of guitar and then you go to another type of guitar, quite often it can be a bit of a dispiriting experience because you mm. expect it to do the things that your other guitar does and very often that's not the case. So you have to kind of let it be a Strat, which is... Um, yes, let it be a Strat. Quite difficult if you don't know what that means or how to do it. Let it be a Strat. <laughs> let it be a Strat. Yeah, all that. Yeah. Uh, you might find, so one of the main decisions about modern strats is do you go for the two pivot bridge or the six screw vintage one um the two pivot one is much more uh efficient stays in tune better if it's set up right but players if you've come from a fixed bridge guitar you'll find it hard work because it moves um because there's up bend it floats so when you rest your hand on it you'll detune the guitar some people find that difficult um, in which case, go for a six-screw one. Um, but if you've come from a guitar that does have a very efficient vibrato, you'll find the six-screw one too cr cronky and weird and old-fashioned. Um, so have a look at a two-pivot one. Um, if you don't want to use a vibrato, get a six-screw one and put it flat and enjoy the sound that happens next. Indeed. Yeah. Very good. Good luck, Jason. William Young. Thank you both for taking away my shame of getting gear I'm not good enough for. <laughs> I pulled the trigger and now I'm three Absolve weeks... Absolve thee of thy shame. 
So, I, I, I'm I'm three weeks into a twelve month lead time on a black sixty eight Landau signature, and I couldn't oh. be more excited. Oh, come on! What a great guitar! You know what? I just if you enjoy it and you can afford it, it's like I I don't know any other industry. It's like if you if you've worked all your life and what you've wanted is a, is a Ferrari, and you end up being, you know, at the end of your working life, it's like, you know what, I'm going to go and get that Ferrari. I don't know anyone that would go, no, oh, no, mate. You know, that's you should be you should be ashamed of yourself getting that guitar. You can't drive it like a Formula One race. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. come on, man. It's this stuff is amazing. Yeah. If you you know th these these pedals and guitars made by these incredible artisans and you know it's like. I, I want this. I can afford it. It's like I'm gonna have a lot of fun with it. I feel shame for buying it. Oh my! Yeah, yeah. Far out. I'm, yeah. 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 Doesn't make any sense? I mean, I, you know, you might feel some shame when you buy the twenty third custom shop strat, but that's fine too. Uh, enjoy that guitar when it arrives. Mark Carey says, "Hey chaps, thanks for all the good work. What pickups did Simon put in his fifty four Les Paul that made it sound ten times better?" I just bought one too as my lockdown present. Um, I've forgotten the name. Can you remember the name? No. Let me text him. I don't even know if I've got my phone here. Yeah. Uh, Dan's going to text Simon and ask him what, what he bought. Um, they actually came from Ed Alesco. Ed's vintage guitars and amps, who's a friend of ours. Um, and Ed got in touch with Simon and said, do you want some of these pickups? I've got some. They're quite hard to get hold of. But it, uh, according to Simon anyway, it has transformed the guitar. He gutted it and put in a 50s wiring harness and all that. 50s wired harness. And um, according to Simon, it's just so much more responsive and all the rest of it. Timing him now. Yeah. See on the we'll see. Back. Yeah. I know he's looking after his son this afternoon, so he may... Um, Smack the fourth. He might be, be in front of some version of Star Wars. <laughs> he might be building castles and stuff like that. Uh, oh yeah, May the 4th. Uh, I wish a happy wedding anniversary to my wife, Catherine. Yes! Your uh, wedding anniversary today. our wedding today. anniversary today. Nine years, Dan. Nine years. Unreal, mate. Congratulations. Yes. Amazing. Um, we'll come back to that, Mark. Chris Gibbs. Hello, you fine purveyors of tone. <laughs> like Mick, I think all pedals sound best at 2pm. <laughs> but then I think I should turn them up full to get my money's worth. <laughs> Very Am I good. the only one? That is so great. I've never heard that before. Yeah, very <laughs> good. That's very good. That is hilarious. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, Chris? Uh, obviously, taking as read the fact, the the proven fact that all pedals sound best at two o'clock. Um, <laughs> Fight me. Um, one thing we don't tend to crank on our overdrives is the volume knob. Man. Because depending on what amp you've got, that can be crazy loud if you're dealing with a bit of headroom in the amp there. But they do really, a lot of overdrives sound fundamentally different with the volume cranked. Let alone the gain or the, you know, the tone pot. So it's definitely worth exploring. Ben Turner. Hey guys, should I wait to buy a Dimension C or other non-true bypass pedals until I have a loop switcher? Or am I being overly scared of buffers? Uh, you don't have to wait at all. Especially with Boss, you don't have to worry too no, much. No, the, the Dimension C is, is unreal. Mm. What you might find is where that pedal is going to be in your chain, it might actually help. Um, because it will be a constant. The thing about buffers, and I've been having conversations with various people over the years about buffers and it's it's really interesting. The if you get a buffer, the sound of the buffer that you like, if you've got, you know, regardless of the output impedance of the buffer, because I'm looking at the output impedance of some peak corners and stuff, it's not crazy low. But it's what it is is a constant. And if you find if you if it works for you, then you've got a constant there, and you've, you know you might find the cables that you, you prefer with, but then it's always going to be that constant. And then you set your amp up, and you set the pedals up into it and stuff. Awesome. Um, the 
Okay, from memory, the Waza DC2 doesn't use uh, like uh, like a simple transmitter. I think it emit a follow-up buffer thing. I think they're actually using op amps in the Waza series. They've upgraded the buffers. Um, I'm not 100% sure that is the case on the DC2, but I dare say. Um, and it's great. Really, really great. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't wouldn't be concerned about that at all. Um, no. Um, yeah, okay. Doesn't say. Just as they've greatly improved the internal bypass because the bypass on the original one was a bit sucky. Right, okay. That's, well, that's not boss's yeah. actual language. But, right. Um, yeah, so don't be concerned. They're great. Yes, don't be concerned. Um, I one I had an issue with the DC two is it crapped out. It caved in a bit when I was hitting it with loads of other stuff. Right. And I don't know if that was a. Do you remember we had it yeah, on the board that day and I was hitting it with the Kingsley preamp and it was like, uh, no thanks. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So that's the. <sighs> yes, of course. So it will have an amount of headroom. You know, like all those circuits do, we'll have an amount of headroom before it limits. So, you know. Yeah, and it definitely seemed to be lower on that pedal than it is. So it, right. it wasn't crapping out my delay or my um, reverb or anything like that. Mm. But it, it was hurting the DC, interesting. The DC2 Wazza. I should get to the bottom of that, really. Yeah, interesting. Um, the BXLR. The BXLR. Gents. Much love from SoCal, California. I recently picked up a 50th anniversary Strat, but it responds to my soul food differently than my PRS Custom 24 SE. Quick primer on gain stages for Strats, please. Um, yes, okay. So your PRS Custom 24 SE has got humbuckers. And they treat overdrive pedals completely differently than single coils in something like your 50th anniversary strat which is quite a traditional strat so obviously the humbuckers will overdrive the will help the pedal get into overdrive that bit quicker and you'll have a more even dynamic response across the notes probably whereas the strat will be spikier plinkier and you'll probably need to set the gain of the soul food much higher mm. to get the equivalent sound and response yeah very nice pedal tyson tone Tyson Tone, uh, Chris, were um, Simon's pickups. Tyson Tone. I'd never heard of them either. That's what they are. But apparently they're the thang. So, yeah, so um, generally the BXLR, you just got to turn the gain up in the pedal more if you want the same sound. But but bear in mind that the, the whole envelope of the note from something like the Custom 24 with humbuckers is entirely different than it is from a Strat. So it's not just about the fact that there's less output, as it were. The shape of that output is different in terms of the relationship between the initial transient and the, the decay. So it's just a different kettle of fish. Yeah. Strat's going to be a Strat. Anything to add, Dan? No, that's I mean, the... The... The, the humbuckers are going to make the pedal limit quicker because you're hitting those rails faster. So with the Strat, it might just be that you need to turn the gain up, which will make it limit faster. Um, but again, you know, depending on what volume and everything that you play, you might find that uh, this, you know, um, are you specifically trying to get the same amount of gain or the same sound from the guitars? I mean, one thing that I'm really aware of is that I want, I you know, between my, I want the top end to be clear, which is why I've got a bright list pull and I, I want to be able to just plug guitars into the rig, but then I want the guitars to do their own thing. Um, so it might be that the you plug the Strat in as it is and it might be just zingier and doesn't overdrive as much, but that might sound awesome. Uh, but yeah, just have a, just have a play with that uh, gain range. Gary Varner, 
Gary. Hi, Gary. He says, VCQ has been such a valuable hangout. Thanks so much, boys. Um, Dan, what are your f- top five XTC tracks? Oh, and now you're talking. Why aren't the go betweens better known? Um, top five XTC tracks. Okay, I've got to say, Sensor's uh, working over time now. I know that might sound like a cop out, um, but that was the song I was playing when I met my wife. So I've got to include that. Um, also, okay, Jason and the Argonauts, I love that track. Um, we Don't Need Another Satellite, oh man, absolutely beautiful, there are so many. Uh, um, I, Dave Gregory's guitar solo on Supergirl uh, is, for my, is, is the perfect guitar solo. It's, astonishing um also he played that on eric clapton's the fool guitar did he so he was he was recording with todd rundgren yeah, in the studio todd and the tom guitar, had that guitar it was just it just leant up against the wall in the corner yeah <laughs> you know st- still had the original strings on it and dave said oh can i borrow that guitar to play that solo he goes yeah sure um so that's really important tune for me um let's see our uh, uh, real by real, and Scissor Man. Oh, but also Peter Pumpkinhead. Ah, oh, Peter. Okay, Peter Pumpkinhead's going to definitely be in the top five. Scissor Man. And there's a live version of Scissor Man. Oh man, I that. Yeah, it's too hard to put them. But yes, that lot certainly. Um, it's just astonishing. He for, for me, he uh, Andy Partridge. Uh, Beatles. Um, Neil Finn and Andy Partridge. Wow. Absolutely. That's some company. Just, yeah. And Andy sent me an email a couple of weeks ago. He's still planning on some some point coming on the show. He, he is a genius. He is an absolute genius. So, uh, and I've had a chat to him about songwriting before and the, the, the stuff that he comes out with when he's talking about creating music is absolute pearls of wisdom it's just yeah I'm, I'm i'm in awe of the man awesome yeah. that'll be a fantastic show be un- unbelievable i'll be a just a burst into flames by the end of the day <laughs> i just walk outside and just combust yeah, apo- yeah w- with apologies to anyone who's been on the end of this there is actually something called s h c spontaneous human combustion yeah yeah like, it's a thing. It's not a very common thing. No. But it is a thing. Imagine that. It's like, well, why did he... Why did he... Why did my father suddenly be, was engulfed in flames? Well, he uh, unfortunately suffered spontaneous human combustion. You're like, get out of here. No way. I'm not accepting that. You're a quack. I Show me your doctor's certificate. So, that, uh, when I was a kid, you had... You had the Loch Ness Monster... Bigfoot, UFOs, and spontaneous human combustion were all in the same <laughs> books in, at the library. You know, the section was like 10 books in total, and that was in there as well. You know, great mysteries of the world. So, and it's fast, like, it is absolutely fascinating. They've, they've got some theories now about what might cause it. Yeah, I was stood in a bucket of petrol, <laughs> <laughs> having a ciggy. Oh no, I seem to have spontaneously combusted. Uh, just for the record, don't stand in a bucket of petrol under any circumstances, whether smoking or not. Yes. It's not advisable. Ian Fan uh, says, I bought a Gretsch Electromatic centre block DC with my first Bigsby. Do you have any tips for keeping it in tune other than taking the Bigsby off? <laughs> Mick has this sorted out. I've got three tips for you. Um, and I'm no Bigsby expert, but... As with any vibrato system, you need to minimise the points of friction and potential slippage. And those points of friction are wherever the string touches the guitar. So here, you're not going to get much there back mm-hmm. in the tailpiece because um, it's pretty tight over there. So you're not going to. That's not going to be a massive problem. The saddles is always a big problem on any 
uh, vibrato guitar because obviously as you move the vibrato up and down, the strings need to go backwards and forward. Similarly, the nut, same deal. The strings need to travel through the nut when, mm. you, when you're doing your wanging. So these points here need to be well lubricated. Now, if it's very hard steel material, chances are that'll be fine. But you may find that some something like um, that nut source stuff or even just a bit of pencil graphite can really help. Some people go to the extent of having Graftech saddles and things like that. You don't need them um, necessarily. Secondly, the nut, uh, you can buy products for this, but I just pull the strings out the slot, rub a pencil over there, mm. get the graphite into the slots, and it makes the world of difference, right? <laughs> It's not too bad. Yeah. And bearing in mind that before I set this guitar up, before I put the pickups in, it would it would be madly out of tune just by going like. It would be madly out of tune. Can you do the pencil thing on the bridge? Probably, yeah. Okay. I yeah, it's never been a big problem for me, but if the saddles are made of some cheap stuff, what happens is the strings eat into the saddles and yeah, they, yeah, they get yeah. stuck. That's Pot metal. So, so that's. Thing one is make sure all the points of contact are well lubricated. Thing two is this spring makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, is that what is that what uh, Duesenberg had engineered some magic spring? I think the Duesenberg one is just beautifully engineered all right. over. That it's eerie. Do how some, good that thing is. Do some reading on the spring. You can buy retrofit springs in different. Um, Strength and, and levels, yeah. specific spaces and things like that. My knowledge isn't very good. I haven't done it on this guitar, um, but it's something that you can do. And it's just back to the bridge for a second. Gretsch has made all kinds of different bridges over the years. So sometimes it might be what's called a rocking bar bridge, which actually yeah. moves with the vibrato. So that's thing two, do some work on the spring. Thing three is always tune up to a note. So yeah. the nature of uh, tuners is, most old school tuners anyway, is they load with tension. So if you tune, you know, if you're tuning your E string, tune up to it, because then the, the tuner is loaded and the chances of it slipping back are less. If you tune down to the note, I just I naturally just gave it a little tweak back up again just because I've been doing it for so long. Um, there, there's there's just a slightly increased chance that the string can slip back through, um, exacerbated by how well your nut is lubricated, misses, um, because obviously there's a relationship between the tension here and the tension here. So as long as the nut's well lubricated, you should be all right with that. Sorry, a bit Paul Kossoff with Bright on the end. So there you go. Those are my top tips for your Bigsby, and I am no Bigsby expert. I'm trying to I'm trying to play without vibrato and still make it sound good, and it's really hard. Well, it's hard to make it sound good anyway. Isn't that all jazz guitar players ever? Isn't isn't vibrato a sin in jazz? Mm, no. no right. However. One vibrato that I really like is instead of doing this, where the note only goes sharp, you do this, and the note goes flat and sharp. Like your cello. Yeah. But you've got to grab... Wow. That's freaky. Yeah. That's like you've got a vibrato pedal built in. Yeah. How do you do that? So you're, you're pushing the note flat and then Pull it sharp. So instead of going, it just goes, it just goes to the note and sharp with this. Oh, I see. So it's relative to how close to the fret you are. Well, it's, well I'm changing the tension. I'm actually, when, when I push the string this way, yeah. I am. Oh, no way. Yeah. Yeah. So you, classical players do it. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's a really interesting way to do vibrato. So you, you're actually, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. 
Wow, I never knew that. Every day's a school day, Dan. <laughs> Jonathan Jeruzic. Hello, Jonathan. He says, hey, gents. Can you talk about boost pedals in an effects loop or even using an overdrive gain pedal in an effects loop? Not many know this trick. Um, we've looked at it in various shows over the years. We have. And it's a really great thing to do. If you get the right voiced boost pedal, it's really great as an attenuator. Uh, the most important thing with the boost pedal is it has to have enough headroom to be able to handle the line level coming from the effects send. Every valve amp has what would be different. And of course, if you crank the preamp, you're going to be sending a lot more level. Um, like my matchless, for example, is the volts it puts out in the preamp signal is just out of control. So getting a, a pedal that has enough headroom to handle that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Most modern amps are instrument, have instrument level effects loops, so it shouldn't be a really big deal. If, if you've never tried this, the biggest, um, the area where you'll notice most benefit is if you've got an amp that's overdriving and there's not much you can do to boost it. So if you boost in the front end, all you get is more overdrive because the preamp's already maxed out. So mm. if you stick, depending on how the amp's designed, if you stick a boost in the effects loop, it can give you that solo boost. Alternatively, if you stick a boost in the effects loop at less than unity volume, it can give you a volume drop. Yeah. So you, <laughs> it's a counterintuitive way of thinking about it. You play all your rhythm stuff and everything else with the boost on, but at lower, lower than unity, you turn it off, let your amp breathe its fiery glory mm -hmm. um, at full chat for the uh, for your solo bit. It's a great way to do it. Called underdriving. Yeah. Really wonderful way to do it. Yeah. Um, another thing that you can do is if you've got to play at low volume. Sometimes a mix of compression and boost in the loop of an amp can yeah. give you a bit of sort of saggy feel. Yeah, um, can can work really well. We we have done a few shows on it over the years. Yep. Um, yeah, nice. Thomas Cook. I played for ten years plus, but just got in oh into pedals. I bought eight powered with the gig rig in four months. They make my American Pro Two Strat into a twin sound epic. Awesome. I respect few people more than good teachers, and you're the two of the best. Small token, ah, my thanks. Thanks, Thomas. We're that's glad, lovely. Thank you, mate. Glad you're enjoying it. It does open up a whole world of different things. I, I, I remember my drama teacher. Actually, no, she was my English teacher. She took me aside after one lesson. She said to me, Dan, you should be a teacher. I said, you're drunk. <laughs> I wouldn't do it for all the money in the world. <laughs> no, they not. work so hard. Oh, my word. Um, yeah. yeah. It's one of the jobs I wouldn't do for it's any salary. Man alive. But God, there's, it's such a calling. I've had I've had teachers that have changed my life. Mm. I, Mrs. Hayes, when I was I in grade three. My life. <laughs> they've got the potential. They didn't. It's a joke. Um, but I'll never forget Mrs. Mrs. Hayes in grade three. Um, I'd moved around a lot when I was a kid, and I went to 11 different schools. Wow, that's tough. Yeah. But Mrs. H so... Did you uh, steal something from every single one, or was it violence-related, or...? <laughs> no. Um, just, just we moved around a lot. But uh, Mount Gravatt State School, Mrs. Hayes in grade three, I'll never forget her. So we were doing... We are talking about... Um, uh, Dreamtime, Aboriginal Dreamtime, and they're basically their um, their myths and, and legends and stuff. And I'll never forget this. There was this there was this story about how the sun was created, about this emu grabbed its egg and threw it in the sky and created the sun. And um, Mrs. Hayes says to me, "So is that true or is that false?" And I said, "I was rubbish." And she said, she said to me, "How do you know?" And I'm like. Uh, because surely it is. She's like, but how do you know? Do you know? You know, and she just made me th wait, think about things that, okay, okay, I, I, surely I know that that's not true, but is it just because it's something I've heard, you know? And she just made you look at things in a different way. And that that's, and I'll never forget that. And then years later, I remember coming across another kid that was in 
her class. It must have been, you know, must have been by grade 12 at that time. He said to me at the same time, do you remember Mrs Hayes? I'm like, yeah, man, she was amazing. And he said, but how do you know? But how do you know? Yeah. So a bit of philosophy. I, I'm a passionate believer that philosophy should be taught to all kids from as early as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Wonderful. Definitely. Yeah. How did there we get onto that? Uh, teacher. He said, thank you. You guys are great teachers. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. I should say, say thank you to Michael Collins, who was uh, my teacher in the last year of school, who encouraged me big time to bring my guitar in and play and right. at primary school and do all of that. Lovely. Yeah. I told him one day I wanted to be a bass player. He's like, don't be a bass player. Nobody cares about the bass player. It's a great thing to say to an 11-year-old, isn't it? <laughs> His brother played guitar, good guitar player. So yeah, Michael Collins. Thank you, Michael Collins. Wonderful. Um, right. Also, Mr. Meninsky from from uh, Springwood High, music. I didn't. I wanted to do music at school. There weren't enough people in my high school that wanted to do music to have a class. So Mr. Meninsky, every lunchtime, I'd walk around with Mr. Meninsky, and he'd teach me. Bless him. At his lunchtime, just we'd just walk around talking about music. So it's his fault. It's totally his fault. <laughs> totally. Well, get this. Uh, in I did GCSE music, and there was two of us did GCSE music. But you still had a class. Yep. Ah. Oh, so and we, we didn't have sit, enough people to have a class. Ray Wheeler, who was the uh, teacher, he had his this little office thing off the music room. We used to sit in there and have a cup of tea. GCSE music wow. never be allowed these days. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Um. With David Noble. David Noble was the uh, my partner for GCSE Music. We both used to fall asleep. <laughs> uh, Jack Petch. Jack Petch. Hi guys, do you ever find yourselves doing the occasional stereo patch in your wet dry rigs, ping pong or rotary? If so, how does it translate in a live mix? I've started doing stereo more um, because, simply because of the of the reverb, the CXM reverb and the um, Future Factory. I'm the way it works because both the amplifiers that I use, they they sound wonderful with effects. They're very different sounding amplifiers, um, but you know they all work with effects. I don't have one one amplifier sort of particularly dimed, um, so they both have headroom. So yeah, it works brilliant. Once you've like. I've always been really happy with just a bit of, um, you know, reverb going to one amplifier and a bit of spring reverb in the other. That's always worked great. But the CXM has sort of made me ask some different questions about how all that stuff works. And, and uh, you know, I love the fidelity of the, the Future Factory. However, one thing I am experimenting with is using the Future Factory in mono and having a tape delay, being able to just have different delays going left and right. Or you know, or you know, or wet dry or whatever. Um, but yeah, having the the CXM in stereo is just the most glorious, glorious yeah, thing. Hell of a sound, isn't it? It's a good question about the live thing, though, because your implication that it does get lost a bit, and you're absolutely right mm. that it does. Um, you, unless you're in a fairly regular production, and either you have control over the sound of the monitor mix, or yeah. you're um, sound engineer is particularly um, willing to put up with your <laughs> with your needs. It is difficult. Mm. Uh, that's the, one of the reasons I never use stereo really live. Is yeah. purely that. That's and, why wet dry works so yeah. well. And to come on to your question about the rotary, that's why I use the um, all, rotary is always wet dry because I find with any modulation effect f effects, it tends to disappear. Mm. tend to lose definition and then what you do you want to turn up and then all your frequencies are out and the singer starts moaning at you I start moaning at myself um, but yeah if you're if you're in control of your live sound and everyone's listening then I think it can work really well but yeah. like Dan said I'm pretty sure that as soon as we get start back to get to gigging I will even ditch the stereo d reverb and delay Right, it's yeah. just too much hassle. Yeah, uh, no, okay, I get that. But it does sound utterly amazing. If anyone has ever seen Andy Timmons live, yeah, that is the best stereo guitar sound live I've ever heard. One of the best guitar sounds I've ever heard. Full yeah, stop. Yeah. Monster. Oh, and you know, he, he's a guy that has regularly brought me to tears with his playing. Just so emotive and so beautiful. And he, 
the way he sculpts those stereo sound lands soundscapes. Yeah. Something else. It is. Something else. else. What's that from? Little Britain. Um, oh yes, well done. Raphael Curti Freitas. Raphael Curti Freitas says, um, you inspired me to get a second GE GTD 665S, which I'm guessing is an amp, um, to run wet dry. I'll lose some cabinet space, but I'll never have to unload a dishwasher again. <laughs> Is, at the risk of a sexist comment, is it a peculiarly male thing to hate the dishwasher? I do it every day. You like I, the dishwasher? Yeah, it's, it's the, I, I think I've done it, it's sort of the thing that I, I look job. after cleaning after the kitchen. Your job. And I like it. Yeah. I like it. I really like, because it's, you know, the kitchen isn't massive and it can get messy real quick. Yeah. Um, especially with two kids. Especially with two kids, man alive. Could you think they can... Uh, you know, put your fourteen year old, dishwasher. sixteen year old. Could they? Do you think they could just rinse out a dish and put it in a dishwasher every now nope. and then? No, nope. not physically. Not a chance. So doing, and they're really good kids. Mm. There's something. If you throw the dish at them, and it breaks against the wall, soon there'll be no dishes left. That's how it happened in our house. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's like, what do I do now? Where do I eat my cereal? Eat it off. The <laughs> <laughs> like That's the very Kill Bill. Like the dog you are. It's very Kill Bill. Yeah. Uh, my house wasn't like that. Um, Angus McLean says, Hello from Calgary, my favourite pedal giants. Joe is helping me with power setup from the gig rig. I think a wetter box would be a great addition. How would each of you use it with G3? Other switches are available. Indeed. Uh, how would I use the wetter box with G3? Yes. So what I would probably do... Because, okay, a couple of things. Because the weather box is stereo, so if you had something like something like this that has, uh, you know, just turn the mix right up to 100% wet, and then use the weather box to blend that stereo in, um, it's a really, really amazing sound. Um, so you do that with the expression pedal. That's really cool. Um, but the other thing is parallel drives is a really fantastic oh, nice. way to use the weather box. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, having, it's like, I love big, big muff sounds, but there's always light on the mid. So getting a, a, a mid rich overdrive on one side, loop A, and a big, big muff in loop B, and just blending them and finding that point That's and then putting shot. that into a loop. And they doing that, you create find really unique sounding drive combinations and it's a great way to find your own um you know your own gain staging it's really really cool you can actually do that with the parallel and then some to mono in g3 you can do that in g3 anyway but you, that it does mean you don't have the mix control yeah that's that's the difference yeah. um but you know you, you could do that with the with the you know with the volume on the pedals you can do that internally in G3, which is really cool. Um, but I really love just having a you know a loop dedicated to that particular sound and finding that point. Um, yeah, it's it's nice, really nice. I like Dan's suggestion of of blending in your wet stuff. Yeah, on the doing fly. that on the fly is amazing. Yeah, yeah. I was somewhat I want to experiment with actually, and I don't know whether it's either plug in a an expression pedal into. To whatever pedal it is you want to blend in and out, but I love the idea of that. You know, as, as you play louder and quieter into delays and reverbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to. It, it can either get overpowering yep. or not enough, and yep. you don't have that control. So having that just on the fly. Totally. Yeah, nice. Enjoy, enjoy, Angus. Uh, Do Toro says hi, Dan and Mick. Do Toro, I would like to suggest the challenge: the three classics toned challenge. You have to pick a classic amp tone, Marshall Vox or Fender, and use pedals to get the other two. That's a good Ooh. shout. What a good shout. Hello, what that's a great. great. Idea. I'm totally going to screen grab that. Do, that's a great, great, great suggestion. Thank you. For anyone who didn't get that, so we pick, let's say Dan picks a Marshall. He then has to pick pedals to get a Fender and a Vox sound. Nice. That's really good. I like that. Because we always say, you know, Pedals don't really sound like amps, and they never do. Uh, but 
that doesn't change the fact that you can't carry three amps around, so you at least have to have a stab at it. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Jamie Brown. Hi, guys. My wife got me two T-shirts sent to Boys, Idaho for my birthday. Thanks for sending it. Also, I can't wait for Matt Berry to come on. I'm in love with that guy. Yeah, Matt's the best. <laughs> Absolute yeah. 90s. So Matt has released another album. He's the guy is just prolific. Uh, the plan is that we're going to get Matt on when we're doing um, the live stuff with the band. Great. And we're going to play a couple of tracks of his with nice. the band. Awesome. It'd be wonderful. Too cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mons. Hello, Mons. He says, greeting from Redlands, California. Thank you for introducing me to the Supro Tremolo. It's worth leaving on most of the time for that gain stage alone. I'm running it wet dry and it brings me such joy. Oh, lovely. Yeah. yeah. I've been on my board for a long time. Yeah. Yep. Really cool sounding thing. Um, Reza El Ghazi. Reza El Ghazi says, uh, Thanks, guys, for persistently fueling our collective gas. <laughs> Home, I use dry mono, full range flat response on the side and two wet studio monitors. I dig my sound. But is this just technically wet, dry, wet, or dry, wet, wet, or just plain stupid? So he's got dry mono full range flat response and mm -hmm. two wet stereo studio monitors yeah that's wet dry wet isn't it wet dry wet but if you've got the FR, FR over there and then you've got your monitors then it is indeed dry wet wet yeah yeah I guess the idea is if you've got your dry in the centre yeah yeah but that's you know it's definitely not stupid no brilliant it's Tobias Brandt hi Tobias he says I'm getting a custom based on a Colling CL, already specced, uh, Ron Ellis's P90, Brazilian mm. rosewood board, Honduran mahogany body and neck, and a maple carved top. Anything I should watch out for? Ideas yeah, on thieves. tuners? Thieves. <laughs> tuners and bridge. Um, Colling CL, so the CL is their Les Pauli one, isn't it? Maybe. You would know. Yes. Right, bridge, don't know. Uh, whatever Collings uses is going to be the best available. Yep. So that's a good place to start. So, sorry, is he, it's based on a Collings, is that yeah, right? Yeah, he's, he's okay. having a custom oh, right. guitar made. Um, go, with the, go with the guitar maker's suggestion, but assuming you're going for a stop tail and a tunematic arrangement, um, yeah, you either get something modern and well engineered, like a mastery or something. Yeah, I don't know much about tunematics. Or you get something vintage spec made out of the right stuff. Yeah. And that's yeah, much yeah. harder to find. Yep. Um, because the particular aluminium alloy that they used wasn't you what, know what everyone seems to think it was. Yeah. So I tried a couple of different uh towel pieces on my old my sixty one junior. I took the towel piece off, it's light as anything. Mm. And put the same strings on three different bridges. Sounds nothing like it. Just everything that I love about that guitar was gone. Put the original thing back, and it's just this light piece of aluminium. And it's mm -hmm. like I could not believe the difference yeah. that having that metal yeah. makes. Well, Joey's been through the mill, hasn't he? Trying to get his right on his guitar, and I think this is well known among people who know these things. But the, it's not aluminium on the old guitars. Is it not? It's it's got some name. It's an alloy of some kind. Wow. Um, I think it's an aluminium alloy, but um, it's a different material. Anyway, the comments will be coming in thick and fast as to what it is. But Tuners. Um, I am a big fan of light tuners. I have no idea why. Partially for the balance of the guitar. Right. Partially because all the guitars I like have light tuners. Like the Clusons, etc. Yeah, like not Grovers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Interesting. They add, they add a significant amount of mass to the to the headstock. They were Ooh. fine for Jimmy Page. What are the tuners on on the gold top? Yeah, the proper snot key. Okay. Yeah, you've got Grovers on yours. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, they were fine for Jimmy Page, and lots of people swear by Grovers mm. on on Gibsons. So don't you know? Don't take my word for it. But um, yeah. Uh, Paul Smith is a big advocate of light tuning pegs. Wow. Um, 
And yeah, all my favorite guitars have got light tuners on. So I don't know if there's anything in that or not, or whether it's just in the brain. It, ergo, go for the ones that look the best. Uh, Peter Wasted. Thanks, Peter. No question, maybe it'll come in. Um, Sergio Ramos says, ever thought of a modeler versus a real world effects counterpart? Helix has some preamp blocks that meant to go in the place of an effects loop or a tube amp, so that would be interesting to see. Greetings for the Philippines. Yeah, no, is the answer. We're just not interested. Yeah. Um, I read a really interesting post the other day and someone who'd gone back to pedals and he said, the stuff sounds really good, he said, but he spent so much time tweaking yeah. and so little time playing. Yeah. Um, and, that, I mean, that what the stuff is, it, you know, man, it's amazing. If you're a, um, you know, if you're touring and you've got, no setup time and no tech and all that stuff, you know. No if, luggage. No, yeah, <laughs> if it's a um, champagne taste beer budget, that stuff is amazing, yeah. you know. I've just... The, the, the misconception is that we don't like this stuff because we don't know it. And the reality is we've both played a lot of this stuff. All of it. And, uh, and it... We have got so much respect and that stuff, you know, it does sound great. For us personally, we've just found um, there's a real, I don't know, I've got no interest in modelling a 1961 AC30. I've got a 1961 AC30. It sounds unbelievable. Mm. I'll use that. You know what I mean? It's just like, because that's the sound I love. I don't, I, so I've got that. I don't need 1,200 other amplifiers, you know? Um, but if, if what you need is a huge variety of those tones that sound really good, there it's, you know, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, there's, there's certainly a case to be made, as Dan suggested, for, you know, for value for money, for practicality, ease of use, certainly low, low volume use makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I just... I mean, it sounds a bit harsh, but I just, I am, I am just fundamentally, I lost interest in that stuff mm. after I think my 10th Line 6 press conference where they t turn around and say to you, this year it really does sound like valves. I'm like, do you know what? I'm done. <laughs> I had and, and I have, I've, we, Dan and I have, tr you know, it sounds like we're defending a position. It's not. We've tried. We do tip, dip our toes into waters of stuff and all that, uh, we just end up making shows that we don't really want to make. Yeah. And it, it's not to spend pour any scorn on anyone who uses that stuff or you know I, I would never judge someone else's choice of gear I just would never do it you know just play what you love and don't Absolutely. play anything else whatever gets you playing man that's 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 everything yeah but I, likewise it does get a bit old when you get consistently judged for your choice of gear it's like this is what I like you know yeah. I've been doing this my whole life yeah I've been in the privileged position of being sent every piece of gear under the sun yeah and I have truth be told I don't have any more questions about gear. Yeah, right. What I know is it was probably made before 1965 and it cost, <laughs> and it cost 20 grand. Yeah, right. And <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's that's where I am with it. Yeah. And so the reason that me and Dan do this is because we love that stuff. Yeah, totally. And we love this stuff. Yeah. And we do it for the love of it. And life is just not long enough to do stuff you don't love so with absolutely. apologies yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the good news is that every other youtube channel in the world does that stuff absolutely so we're the odd ones out yeah really when as soon as one of those products is released you just type in the first letter of whatever that product is and you'll see everyone's done everyone it. else yeah, yeah. but us you don't need us to tell us we no, don't we don't nuts. like it <laughs> That's i had it. a really interesting thing so i'm recording i'm doing the last guitar tracks on this ep at the moment and I've got the, using the ISO cab, and I've got the mattress at home, and fire, man, the guitar sounds are, are monstrous. But it is that thing where, um, I, and when I did the demo, and I had using all the, the plugins and stuff, and I could get this passed down really quick, doing that stuff with really great tone that's really immediate, it's hard. Mm. You know what I mean? And you've got to be on. Yeah, and it's yeah. one thing, there's a, there's a, I don't know if it's a compression thing or whatever, but I could, it was so much more forgiving 
in that world, and it was you know it's all all great and digital world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, which is awesome, but you've really got to be on your A game when you're. Which is why when you hear you know players like Tom Bukovac playing through you know real amps and 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 just making them sound amazing, which is why when you understand that um, you know that stuff is so revealing. Which is why just in awe of the guy, because mm. everything that comes out is is magical, uh, and but the good thing is, it really highlights the things that you need to work on as a player. Yeah, true. And the the more the more you work with that stuff, you just you cannot but end up sounding and playing better. Yeah, that's certainly been my experience anyway. Yeah, I would agree, and and, and then I guess we should say, well, not everyone has the well, very few people have the wherewithal to be able to play at any sort of appreciable volume. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, but, yeah it's very true. You know, uh, b before any of this existed, I still didn't play guitar at home. I'd hire a rehearsal room. Yeah, yeah, of course. And between rehearsals and stuff, yeah. I just, I couldn't, I, and, and whenever you give an opinion, the assumption is that you disagree with anyone else's opinion. Mm. And it's not like a seesaw. It's not like, here's my opinion, therefore all other opinions are wrong. It's totally. it's equal billing. You know, yeah, everyone's yeah. opinion is equal. So all I will say is I cannot enjoy playing the guitar unless it's pretty loud. And there's that physical interaction of human guitar and speaker. Yeah, I, yeah. I just don't enjoy it. And th that's how rock and roll was born because it feels different. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. a whole different emotional experience when you when you you've got that. I think one of the reasons we're so looking forward to doing our experience days is to get people to come in and go, "Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Have at this." Here we you go. Know? Yeah. And which is not to say that that is everyone's experience or you should like that. And there's no there's no judgment on doing it a different way because equally, I dare say there's millions of people who really don't enjoy that and enjoy yeah. the, you know, the the more a different experience so please don't think I'm trying to say that's how you should do it I'm saying that's how we like doing it and therefore that's what we do on this show wow that all got a bit defensive didn't mean it to come off defensive here's a bit for the beer fund says S Crawford Music may the fourth be with you thank you thank you very much Red Rover and the effing game cat says Polara is a fantastic reverb pedal. I believe that's by Dodd or Digitech. Yeah, yeah. Lexicon algorithms, brilliant pedal. I don't understand why it never gets mentioned. Um, is it Dodd, Polara maybe, or is it Digitech? In any case, all those brands, including Lexicon, are owned by the Harman Group, or they were owned by the Harman Group. And that's why Lexicon turns up in Digitech and Dodd stuff. Right. Yeah. Alex A, cheers from Austin, Texas. Any thoughts on aluminium dust caps on speakers or JBL guitar speakers? Says Alex A. Uh, dust caps on aluminium dust caps. I've played through a JC120 once that had those speakers with them. Dust sounded unbelievable. Yeah, I, I think they were in one of my twins. Once I don't know enough about it. The only is, problem is, is the if someone goes, that looks really interesting, eh, and pokes it, and they go the, the, like a dented ping pong ball. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't have enough experience to comment on that, really. But JBLs, you do? Well, only just because they were in one of my twins and they were in there because I wanted it loud. Yeah. But yeah. they're great. What difference does the aluminium dust cap make, then? Does it make a sound difference? Everything makes a difference, doesn't it? I, yeah. guess, it, I guess it does. Um, yeah. Literally no idea. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Sorry, we couldn't give a better uh, answer. Big Wave Dave. Says, um, great to see you, gentlemen. I have a small stone after fuzz and before my drive pedals. Yes. Awesome. First of all, awesome. And I have a volume drop problem. Yep, with the small stone, an original small stone. Yep. Is it because it's a nano version? Ah, okay, sorry. That small stone. Um, well, the original one probably would have had a... The original one probably had more of a volume drop. As an interesting case in point, if he's not going to mention it himself, it's the reason Dan invented the loop switching system. Yeah. Because of exactly the problem you're having. Yeah. So one of the things with those phases, um, it can... If you look at it on a scope, you'll see that 
the, the volume probably at unity, but often it's, it's what we call a psychoacoustic uh, phenomenon. Because what's happening is you've got your, so the phaser works, you've got your original signal and that's blended in with a signal that is modulating the phase <laughs> in frequency and that's blended in with the original signal. So what happens is as, the, as you get phase cancellations going throughout the frequency range, you're getting those frequencies sort of taken out. And the effect of those frequencies being taken out makes you feel that the volume is quieter. When that's, if you looked at it on the scope, it would probably look like it's not quieter, but it does sound like that. So um, I don't know about the Nano. I don't know if it has a tweakable gain circuit inside. Um, some some phases come with with more than at unity gain, um, but it's a tricky one. So, like uh, putting it in a loop with a boost, because if, if it's a pedal that you use a lot, just get a simple loop, right? A uh, simple loop switch is a single loop switch. Send into the phaser, out of the phaser into a booster, back into the loop, so that when you turn it on, you get your, got your level, louder. Yeah. Phaser. Lots of people make simple true bypass loop switches. I think JHS make one, Full Tone makes one. Yeah. Or Full Tone used to make one, I don't know if they still do. Yeah. Yeah. That'll do it. Um, Daniel Hurst, any advice for meeting people to jam with or how to approach the first jam? After learning during lockdown, I want to get out and play with others. Good for you. Okay. Uh, it, is, it is really tricky. What I would say, I heard, I heard my sister do a talk on this, and it was fascinating. Um, so my sister uh, does a lot in the gospel world, and she was asked this question about how, how people can start playing with each other, and she said, just start. Book a room, book a start time, tell some people, and start turning up. Just start. Just start. And then, then before you know it, people start turning up. So if you turn up there and you're on your own, just play. But tell people about it. Book a space or, you know, and just start doing it. Yep. And if, you, if that seems like a big, um, you know, like a big deal, then find a local jam night. Because yeah, there, there, yeah. there will be one somewhere, and just go down and meet the people. It's, it, it's, a, it can be a very, very intimidating situation. That because, again, I don't want to offend anybody, but a lot of jam nights tend to be somebody who's really interested with a group of friends, and they tend to be pretty tight knit. Mm. And when new people come in, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, who are yeah, you? Yeah. Oh man, it's so oh, that stuff. I just find so weird, and that does happen a lot. I'm sure there are others that are, you know, open arm welcoming to new people. Mm. And I, I guess you've got to navigate that and do a bit of sort of psychology on the best way to... Because you don't want to walk in there and go, hey, when's my slot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because sure. that puts people's backs up. You watch Flood of the Concords. <laughs> it says, okay, guys, I've got you a gig. Um, <laughs> no, actually, he's booking the gig. And it says, uh, yeah, I hear you guys have got an open mic night. It says, uh, yeah, we've got an open mic night. It says... Uh, I'd like to I'd like to get my band Flood of the Concords to come down and play. Says, well, it's an open mic night, so if you come down and put your name on the list, uh, you guys will play. Oh, that's that's fantastic. So I just confirmed that uh, that gig is on. That will come down and and uh, <laughs> yes, the gig is on. If you come down and put your name on the list, okay, <laughs> fantastic. All right, boys, I've got, I've got the gig. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. And they they can be intimidating because you know in that environment you're expected to do your your slot in that in that yeah. environment but yeah jam lights alternatively maybe come at it a little bit easier find anybody else around you a friend who plays and just start the two of you yeah and just you, you'll be amazed at the i don't know can be a bit awkward it's like when you sing with somebody for the first time it can be a little bit awkward as yeah. just everyone gets over their inhibitions and you know you feel self-conscious because you don't feel very good and all of that stuff and you just got to get over that you've, yeah, got, yeah. you've got to without being you know without turning up naked yeah yeah so, you know from experience <laughs> I can tell you don't turn up naked there's to a jam night oh man in um, Succession there's a brilliant um, series called Succession on which is really expensive but anyway um, <laughs> that's one fantastic. of the one of the, yes, one of the 
the sons comes in, they have this meeting, and he goes, look, right, come on, this is a shirts off meeting. He's like, come on, we gotta take our shirts off. So he could, like takes his shirt off. <laughs> uh, anyway, you've got to get over those inhibitions. But once you start, and once you get to know each other a bit, um, you you will be utterly amazed at how much fun it is. It's the reason somebody. we're here. Yeah, it's the reason anyone does this because it's so much fun. My big, the biggest problem. I've done, you probably have the same problem. Is that one day someone paid you to do it. Yeah. It was like, ah, oh, this is yeah, me yeah, yeah. ruined. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it becomes more than the sum of its parts, yeah, and that's yeah, the nature wonderful. of jamming. So try and find somebody, anybody. Um, I guess you could try the local music shop, see if there's any cards up. I know that's pretty old school, but it still happens. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and just start. My uh, daughter uh, has this guy from school, and he was a Beatles fan, so they've started a little jam at our house and on Saturdays they sit out in the garden two acoustic guitars and they play and sing and harmonise Beatle tunes and it's the most wonderful thing so just the, just just start make a start book yeah. a time commit to a time and then just tell people that can I have a play come over or, you know yeah. there's some beers in the fridge and you'll, you'll you will probably start off thinking I'm not good enough and oh god you know I've only just started beginning or whatever After a brief period of ironing out any idiots who don't really want to be there, mm. you'll realise that everyone's in the same boat. Totally. And anyone who's actually any good and worth hanging around and jamming with will only ever be nurturing. Absolutely. And they'll only ever either try and help you or if you're in that position of maybe being a bit more advanced, whatever that means, you nurture that Your responsibility person. to bring yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. And, and it does happen. I promise you it happens. Yeah. It when the environment is inclusive, it, there is nothing like it. The, the, this, um, you'll find if, there, if, 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 if it's exclusive and people are being sort of at arm's length, there's a lot of uh, insecurity yeah. that's coming from a real place of insecurity. Yeah, but, people just turn up to show off how good they are. Yeah, exactly. I, I've, I have been guilty of that. You know, we had a jam night that I was part of and we were a bit like that. There was a moment there we were a bit like that. Right. It's pretty ugly. Y yeah, but if you're still um, if you're still getting people to, it's okay to get up and be awesome as long as you're getting other people up to you know yeah. help, well, that's you know amazing. Yeah. Right, Josh Josh Peregrino, we need to hurry up a bit. Dan. Sorry, mate. What? Did, oh boy, oh boy. Um, Howdy from Austin. I run by the SRV statue every Sunday. And oh think of wow. <laughs> Um, speaking of that, how's the Collings journey coming along? You all are making me itch for an I-30 or a Soko myself, but the wife wants a house. Um, yeah, there is that. Um, well, there, there's been a, a development at actually, mm. in the I-30 journey. There may well be one, or there may not. Mm. Uh, we'll see. I don't know. You're not a fan? I mean, of course I'm a fan. It's unbelievable. But the inlays were on me. Mm. Um, yeah, I've, 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 I have the opportunity on an i30, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it'd be one of the best guitars ever made, of course. Mm. All the stuff is. Yeah. Uh, Brent, oh, please give SRV my, my very best regards. I was listening to him only yesterday. Really? Brent Garner. Um, I finished my parts of caster, Tally style, with Lindy Fraylins. Wow, it's just amazing. Thanks for your effort on the show, the vlogs. I really appreciate the info and the production value. This is a top channel. Well, oh, thanks, thank Brent. you, mate. Thanks for being here. Uh, Giovanni Botta says, Hey, guys, I'm looking for a new amp. Top candidates are a Tone King Imperial Mark II and a Mesa Fillmore 25. I want something more versatile enough to work with both single coils and P90s that works at home volume. The Tone King is the most extraordinary amplifier. The 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 cat the the Cali Tweed is wonderful. Fillmore twenty five. Fillmore twenty five. Sorry, but boy oh boy, that Tone King takes some beating. Yeah, I mean the Fillmore. If you're after kind of Fender Blackfacey type sounds, 
I think the film was a really good shout. Oh, okay. Um, if I'm thinking of the right amp, is that the black? Is that the blackface version of the t of the Tweed one that we've got? Kind of, right. But knowing Boogie, they will have added sixteen channels. Yeah, you got three modes per channel. Yeah, so it's going to do much more than that. Right. Um, yeah, having not spent enough time with the film, or I wouldn't want to advise you, other than to say the Tone King Imperial Mark II is so good. Really, it's really good. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, if you're sort of vintagey minded, doesn't do any kind of modern high overdrive or which you may well get out of the boogie a bit more. So if you're vintagey minded, the Tone King I think sits in a really nice place. Mm -hmm. um, I concur. Yeah, I really like it. I yeah. really do like yeah, it. Me too. I like it. I especially like it with humbuckers. Mm. Yep, magic. Um, good luck. Um, medieval cookery with Arpad. Hey, hey how Arpad. you doing, mate? How you doing? Smoke us a squirrel, Arpad. Delicious. Mm. Guys, you love booty camps and pedals, but you love the big two guitars. May I challenge you? Can ye find a boutique guitar to fall in love with? Uh, Duesenberg, Reverend, Maybach, Novo, Paoletti, whatever. I'll cook for ye. Arr. <laughs> um, yes, Dan really doesn't like boutique guitars. It's not that I don't like them, but they're just... I'm so enamoured with tellies, with, with the tellies that I have, yeah. that they just end up being further down. Now, saying that, I've just got a call from... a text from Carl Longbottom. He sent me some pictures of the guitar. Um, so he's resprayed the inside. This is a few weeks away yet it's going to be hardened uh, but that is a guitar that when I played it was the, the neck just thought this is wonderful and it had that thing if you play a really nice vintage maple neck uh, maple neck guitar um, what I find is the really good ones the really tonal ones are, are very warm and a lot of the maple neck guitars that we that we we associate with being really bright yeah but yeah. But the really good ones, they, they're not like that. They're no. warm and they're thick. This guitar had that thick, warm thing to it. The neck was amazing. So yeah. um, changed it from a T-style guitar and putting a couple of uh, uh, wide-range humbuckers from the Creamery, from Jamie at the Creamery, and a Strat Trem on it. So it's like... It's going to be... I can't wait to see that guitar. Me, it's going to be unreal. Yeah, yeah. So there's that. I, I, th I think you're going to play that guitar. Yeah, I do too. I do too. Um... The other guitar that I have, and I use this live often, is the Krauster. Now, I've just changed the pickups in this, and they sound fantastic, but there's a mid-range in this guitar that's really mid-range, but in a live context, and we when we did the TPS stuff, and we always bought this out for the last few songs, wow. Really, really wonderful. So Totally unique sound, that guitar. Totally. Um, so it's not that... I don't like those guitars, but they have to. It's, I would I would never buy. Not that they're not amazing guitars, but I'd never buy a Sertelli. Just because I've, I've you know I've got three incredible tele you know Fender Telecasters. Yeah. Um, so if I have uh, anything else, it needs to do a different job, which the guitars that I have do. You know, I'll, I'll make a, I'll, I will make an observation that might make sense of this. The reason we like boutique amps and pedals, if you want to call them that, um, is because they tend to be more vintage. So right. my two rock is hand wired point to point, pretty much. Like they used to make them. Same with the matchless. It's more vintage. Um, Clons. I don't know what really good fuzz faces, old tube screamers, um, and and what happens in the the pedal and amp world is tech gets increased, amps become increasingly PCB made, which is no bad thing. We've got plenty of PCB amps as well, but you know, hand on heart, the ones we really love are the are the hand wired ones. Um, pedals the same, you know, they go from being these large component uh, through hole devices, mm. old analog devices to becoming more modern with 
increasingly miniaturized production and all the rest of it. So yeah, one of the reasons we like boutique amps and pedals is because they are more vintage. Mm. And one of the reasons I'm not a massive fan of boutique guitars is because they are more modern. Mm. The boutique guitars I like, Collings, mm. closest thing you can get to a vintage guitar, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's just amazing. Like a really, a really nice vintage guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah totally. Um, a couple of PRSs I like, and my yeah. DGT I really like, but. Yeah. Oh, guess what? It's nitro finished and it's basically yeah, got PAFs yeah, yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's not saying that these things are are better. It's just a it's it's a um, it's a personal preference. Yeah. So yes, uh, we like tend to like the boutique amps and pedals that are more vintage. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. When um, I hadn't realised that until I just explained it. Right. That's very <laughs> good. So. Uh, Pete Thorne, who's a, a dear friend of ours, so he has his his um, his custom Sir guitar, and he can that guitar works brilliantly for him. He can get like the, the amount of sounds that he gets out of that thing is incredible, and it just works so brilliantly for him. And he's a session pro, and he, you know, so yeah, he can yeah, get exactly. so many sounds out of that that guitar. I think the um, and they're you know. There's nothing against those guitars. They are incredible. Yeah. But the the sound of a Telecaster will haunt me to the day I die. You know, and... and me too. It was... <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Very good. Yeah. But they're all great. They're all great. They'd be like, uh, uh, tell Dan uh, his G-string uh, was never uh, in tune. Very good. Yeah, very uh, good. Sorry for the macabre uh, little little thing there. Um, Scott M. Scott, thank you. Uh, no question. So I don't know. I actually haven't brought my phone in, so it might be that we've got to pick that up next week. Ed Bromiel. Hi, Ed. He says, uh, just a massive thank you for inspiring tones and ideas for my work. You guys changed my approach to the guitar. I also work at a library and created a pedal petting zoo program for the public. <laughs> I think it's not a competition, but that wins the day. <laughs> that is the best. Uh, do you know KRP says? How many pedals are too many from guitar to amp? <laughs> You're asking us. Oh, sorry. As far as signal chain is concerned. Um, oh, man. It, uh, Four before a switcher for me. Yeah, I, I say... I say Depending on the pedal, six. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm with him. You know, um, it might be that you've got really good pedals and really good buffers in the in the good positions, and it might all be fine. Um, the The issue then becomes less about tone if those buffers are working for you, and more about making all those things work practically. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I. Yeah, it's, you can't say, can you? No, no, it's really, it's really tricky. There are practical issues why you might want to add a switcher and yeah. separate them out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And again, is why Dan got into the whole thing in the first place because he had too many pedals that were causing too many problems. So, as with any situation of needing to add a piece of technology, you need to define why you need that piece of technology. And for Dan, it was really simple: uh, tone suck, loss of signal. Um, volume inconsistencies and power trouble. Yeah. Look, the reality is, I played this on a session, and I fell in love. I went down to Guitar Crazy in Kuji, and I bought that and a bunch of other things. C1, old tube screamer. This is the and the guy that made that fuzz for me. He had a good day, and this thing sounds incredible. But I put this with anything else, and it makes it sound like rubbish. Yeah. You know, uh, so not when it's on, but when it's off, because it was the buffer and it was so poor. Um, the the you know the bypass state it was so poor. Uh, and that, you know, sort of led me to that thing. It's like, okay, yeah. I need this. I can't now be without this, but I can't have it in the chain. What do I do? But if you had the Thorpey camouflage, for example, no such problem. There you go. Exactly. So it exactly. depends on the pedals. 
Uh, Naganud, have you tried the new American made Epiphone Casino? Seems like your interesting alternative to a 330. What are your thoughts? I haven't tried them. Um, one would assume they're going to be very good. Mm. There is a bit of brand snobbery in there. You know, Gibson's choice was to acquire Epiphone and turn it into a budget brand. So, yeah, a lot of people, I, I, I'd I say there's a lot of people that don't know that, but originally Epiphone was a... A contemporary. Really. You look at, um, that's what uh, John Lennon was, you know, playing those old Epiphones and they were just amazing guitars. Yeah, yeah, Epiphone was, was a high, you know, a higher end guitar company. Um, and then obviously after Gibson acquired it, eventually he chose to make it its sub-brand. And there's a snobbery problem there. Um, so if that, if that bothers you at all, um, it would be great to play one. Key things, the reason I want... The, the, the casino sounds fan-bloody-tastic. It really does. You've it transformed really, that guitar. It sounds great. It sits alongside any of the guitars here in the studio and it is a brilliant thing. I've got two problems with it. I don't like the neck shape <laughs> Okay. very much. <laughs> and I don't like the finish. I really, really don't like the finish. Right. Um, yeah, so I want something a bit more uh, grown up in that respect, and I want a bigger neck, yeah. or at least one that's not like a fl sort of flattish D profile. Um, and I want a nitro guitar because I like the look of nitro guitars, mm. which is you know you you you're skating on the ice of well, what an idiotic thing to do because you've just said the guitar sounds fantastic. Mm. Guitar player brain for you. Yep. Yep. Um, it would be great to try the ep uh, the American Epis. If they're nitro finished, I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. Cool. But I'm going to get a Collins. Are you going to get it? I think so. If not that one, then another one. I mean, it just I think it's the best electric guitar. guitar I've ever played, that yeah. one we had. Yeah. Oh, pff. that thing was crazy. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. You've never stopped talking about it, to be fair. I haven't. Um, oh, listen to that. Spanish cedar. <laughs> Tim Chandler, hello from Bran Bradenton, Bradenton or Bradenton, Florida. You guys are the best ever. <laughs> Said it before, that's Tom Bukovac. Uh, indeed. We'll happily be second place. <laughs> um, have you ever had a guitar plecked and what are your thoughts on the process? Uh, yeah, it's wonderful. My, um, my grey tea style was plecked. Brilliant. I haven't. I uh, had one done personally, but two people I respect enormously in the world of guitar setup and maintenance and knowledge, that would be Charlie Chandler of Guitar Experience mm -hmm. and his brother Doug, um, who was Chandler Guitars in, in Q, both speak highly of the machine, mm -hmm. both of whom are unbelievably talented yeah. uh, guitar people. So if they say it's good, it must be good. Yep. They What they say is, like any machine, it's down to the operator. Yeah, and you've got to have it set up and everything. Yeah. There, there is, if you have a really good luthier, like, you know, so we take our guitars to Johnny Kincaid to get stuff done. And I've been taking my guitars to Johnny for years and there's magic in his hands. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced of it. And there's nothing quite like that when, when you find someone who, who sets guitars up the way that you like them. Um, you know, I guess... Everyone's a bit different, but, you know, just being in that workshop and, you know, with all the, the guitars and bits around you, it's just, you know, it's wonderful. Um, whereas the Plex machine will do it perfectly. It's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be great, but it'll be a, a Plex setup as opposed to Johnny going, you know what, there's a bit of a <laughs> kickback in this fret here. What I might do is just, you know what I mean? That That sort of level of... Artisanship. I've actually never got into it. I've never got into guitar setup. Um, never really given it a second th thought. It's mad, isn't it? All these I, years into guitar. I used to do it as a way of making extra money. Yeah. Um, and it's a uh, really great sound guy taught me how to do it. Yeah. And 
you know, I mean, this getting frets polished. There's nothing like a beautiful. Oh yeah, no, no, you know, I do all, all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but once you've, you know, filed up the frets and you got the the, the neck at the right thing, I was never. I was okay at it, but when you meet, when you find oh, someone yeah. who's an absolute genius at it, it's like, yeah. oh, and okay. it just feels amazing. Yeah, totally. yeah, 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 yeah. The problem for me is when you when you step over that precipice, and then it becomes psychological time when you're playing, thinking about the setup, and that's like now. Nah, yes. Hello, middleman. Not yeah, interested yeah, in yeah, you. yeah, yeah. And then we walk into Paul Stacey's studio, and you've got like fifty guitars variously draped in states of horrific disrepair. And he picks it up and he sounds like God. Yeah. And that, I'll never understand that. Yeah. You know, I pick up what is three, four, five, I think it was, and it's like, wow, you can actually play this. Yeah. And he picks it up and he's yes. like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, he's, he's astonishing. I say, is George Benson in the room? <laughs> <laughs> um, We're going to yeah. see him to, fit, to get the EP um, mixed and stuff nice. in a few weeks once, we can, once we're legally allowed to, which is why I'm trying so hard to get it all finished off. <laughs> But yeah, I'm missing. Uh, um, Tim Chandler, so yes, um, all down to the operator. And if you go somewhere where they use it a lot and they're well regarded, yeah, yeah, 100% yes, yeah. Um, Paul Kylo, uh, no question from you, Paul. So again, we might have to get to you next week if we've missed it. Um, Jason Clute says, no question, just a comment from an earlier discussion. Lindy Fralin also winds the Big T pickups for Analog Man. Oh, wow. So that's that's the Big T I have in the neck of Bylers, and it's yeah. wonderful. Thanks for that, Jason. Yeah. Um, the Spanish Turtle, hello from Idaho. My name's Aaron, and I have a Black Arts Tone Works Pharaoh Fuzz that sounds awesome. But recently, when I stopped playing, it sounds like I'm moving a bias knob back and forth. Have you ever had that? You may want to watch Friday's video. Yeah. Could be a temperature thing. Yeah. I don't know what's in the Black Arts Toneworks Faro Fuzz. Let's see. Oh, also, yeah. check your power supply. Because if you're running off a battery or you're running on a supply that's not supplying it um, with enough volts, should, they, they don't take much current, but with enough volts, then you might find that it's sort of teetering on the edge of of where that bias point is. Can't see if it's... Oh, no, it's silicon. Oh, diodes. Hang on. Not sure. Yes. Do what Dan says. Check your power supply. Um, you might find it varies as to where your guitar volume is as well. Sure. Um, so it, depending on the sort of vintageness of the circuit, that uh, input impedance is super sensitive to your guitar. Everything your guitar is doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know why, but when I turn my down to zero, my guitar volume down to zero, my fuzzes go nuts. Yeah. So could be something to do with that. But mm. do what he says. Power supply first. Second, check the temperature. Try cooling it down and see if that makes a difference. Yeah. <laughs> to wit, watch Friday's video where we um, employ a hairdryer and a bunch of fuzzes to see what happens <laughs> when you uh, pit temperature against fuzz. They Specif all covered, didn't they? Specifically germanium fuzz, I think so, yeah. Eagle Ray Rob, hello, Eagle Ray Rob, and thank you for your amazing generosity. Oh, Blimey. thank you, mate. Um, this month marks my one year anniversary since finding that pedal show. <laughs> this top year, this year's top tone picks now on my board, pedal board include a Gig Rig G3. Ah, oh, legend. Uh, <laughs> a Chase Bliss preamp Mark II, mm. a 978, and a Free the Tone Future Factory. Thanks for being there and for us all. Big hugs and cheers. Well, uh, we don't know if you're Ray or you're Rob. Eagle, Ray, Rob. Um, but blimey, you've showed out a lot of money there. <laughs> yeah. We hope you love it. Wow, yeah, amazing. amazing. Thank you, buddy. Thanks Thank for you. being with us and thanks for your generosity. That's amazing. Uh, similarly, Joshua Cheyenne has also been incredibly generous. Hi from sunny Queensland. I would love to see you guys test your loudest amps. Dimed, no attenuators. The two rock, etc. Um, obviously, you'd need earplugs. Could I post my de debut album to you guys as a gift? It's all analog. Uh, tape, live Chicago blues. Thanks. Uh, you can, Joshua, email the store and we'll gladly take a listen to it. Yeah, yeah, great. 
Um, yeah, it's interesting that um, dime damps. Yeah, because there's a point on an amp that's better than dimed, and it's usually a little bit back from there. That would really, be a fun show. Yeah, really interesting conversation with Phil X about this, um, and he's, you know, it's like you know when when the amp is working, it's it's another instrument, and you have to learn to play the amp um, because you know with the way it's limiting and compressing and stuff. He says there, you know, he's he's got marshals that sound amazing dimed, but he won't play really fast with them. Yeah, because they are so much slower Start to react. Falling over themselves. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, um, so yeah, they. I mean, it's all part of that whole game stage, isn't it? And just learning how things react with each other. Yeah, wonderful. That's a great idea. Yep. We'll do that. Larry yep. Stoltenberg, likewise, thank you for your generosity. No question. So maybe this is something we have to return to next week. And like an idiot, I've come in here without my phone, so I can't tell if BV's messaging me or not. Serial Frost, hello, gents. I'm looking to add a guitar with Filtertrons to my rig. Nice. Should I go TV Jones in a cheaper HH that I can upgrade over time? Maybe a Jazz Master with a Mastery or fork out for a proper Gretsch? Depends what you want. Mm. If you want the Gretsch sound, you really need a hollow body. So when I got my Duesenberg, which was an amazing guitar, it was a Star Player TV, double cutaway. And it was great and I recorded with it, played live with it. Really fantastic guitar. But what I was really after from that was a Gretsch. And I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll take those pickups out and I'll put some Gretsch pickups in it. It didn't work. It's, And then in the old show, when I got that, that Gretsch, I was like, ah, oh, so this is what I was after for that Gretsch sound. Yeah. You, it's, it's not just the pickups. And even the pickups in a Duesenberg, still not going to sound like a Gretsch. Yeah. You know, it's got to be, a, you know, it's got to be a Gretsch. It's like putting... Um, humbuckers in the strats not going to make it sound like a Les Paul yeah and and then I guess do you want the hollow body sound or do you want the sort of chambered jet type sound mm. or even the solid body Corvette type sound but um, assuming well yeah if it's the hollow body sound you want then yes look at the electromatic range and maybe consider upgrading the pickups down the line mm. um, which is a white thing that I've got um, if you're not after the Gretsch sound as such but you want the Filtertrons a great guitar to look at, and I don't even know if they still make it, is the Fender La Cabronita Especial. Oh, yeah, 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 they're they, really cool. They've done various Cabronitas down the years, and you find them used on reverb and stuff, um, our friend's reverb. And, um, uh, yeah, it's like a Tele chassis with two Filtertrons, depending on the, the model you go for. That can be really cool. Um, if you are going to look at a... HH guitar of some other persuasion and stick filtertrons in there. Just be careful of the size of the pickup mounts. Um, the good news is that TV Jones does pretty much every pickup mount and pickup type imaginable. Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to make it fit. You'll be able to get filtertrons that fit. However, they then may only fit in that guitar or something else with humbuckers. So, yeah. Uh, option one. Get a Gretsch, and the Electromatic range is a really brilliant place to start because they're really totally. sensibly priced good yeah, guitars. Yeah. If you if the Gretsch sound is what you want, I, honestly, nothing else is going to sound like a Gretsch except a Gretsch. It yeah. just uh, it doesn't work. I've been down that road. It's spent a lot of money trying to get a guitar that will do everything, and the Gretsch sound. Yeah. yeah, but if it's specifically just the pickups you want, and you're more familiar with solid body guitar, and you don't want a Gretsch, check out the Cabernita uh, by Fender. I think they still do the odd one. In fact, I've got a feeling they might have even done some Squire Classic Vibe ones recently. Oh, yeah, they're cool. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. I could be wrong. But yeah, yeah it's called uh, La Cabronita. Cabronita. Um, Dan, says Curtis R. I'm smitten with my generator distributor isolator setup. Unexpected, extra awesome. It's also light and tidy. Absolutely transformative for my rig. All the best to the team. Gigging. Oh, mate, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. So that's real. Uh, that means the world, mate. Thank you so it's much. It's nice I'm to so... hear. Quite often when we do a pedal board build and it's got loads of gig rig power stuff in it, you get a lot of comments going, why on earth are you bothering with all of that? It's <laughs> and then when you hear it, you're like, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now it does, getting the power right is a really big deal. Thank you, mate. 
Thank you, uh, really appreciate it. Dialawa3 says, Hey DNM, what are your thoughts on external buffers? I'm running a DD7 at the end of my rig for both buffer and delay, but want to switch for something analog. Right. Um. You could, just before Dan answers in great detail, you could bridge the gap and get a Catlin bread belly pock deluxe. There you go. Which is not analog. It's digital, but it sounds analog. It sounds magic. Uh, and it's got a brilliant buffer, a brilliant always-on buffer if you want it. Yeah. So that could be an option. Yep. Totally. Other than that, um, I mean, buffers are really important to know how they work. Um, it's it's so interesting. I I don't know why it's become such a point of. Uh, Snow blindness, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Everyone's it's really so look. It's about their buffers. Yeah. Um, understanding how buffers work is really important. We've done shows on them before. It all depends on... Okay. G3, for example, has got great buffers. It's We've got a buffer in the pre-gain and a buffer in the post-gain. However, when you turn those off, it's there, there are no buffers. Now, the... Output impedance of the buffer in the post gain is 1k. People say, well, why, why is it 1k? Well, think about it like this. If we've got, uh, let's say, a big muff on and we want to add some boost to that, if I change the output impedance of something low, the first thing that's going to happen is you'll get what well, you might perceive more top end going through when actually I'm not, not doing anything with the EQ, it's just changing the output impedance. The general output impedance of the pedals around you know, 1K, certainly, um, you know, up until recently. But 1K can be good. Uh, sorry, 1K is absolutely fine. Um, as long as it's 10 times the uh, divide division of 10 by the input impedance, you are impedance matching and it's all good. Um, but there are times when if I'm... Uh, if, I, if I've got a sound just going straight to the amplifier that I don't want any buffers, and there are times when that's a thing, I can just not have any. Um, if I've got a fuzz face in the sound that I don't want that to be touching any buffers, then I won't have any buffers included. So it is understanding what you want from a rig. So, like, for example, if what you've got is you've got half a dozen pedals and you've got Boost and overdrive and distortion, chorus, delay and reverb. And they're all true bypass. Then having a buffer, um, either at the end of that or after your gain stages, can be fantastic. It'll give you a consistent output impedance going to the amplifier, if it's after at the end of everything. And uh, you set up your amplifier like that, you like, you like the sound of the buffer, it works well, it's got the, enough uh, headroom in it. Um, Fantastic, but if you if you've got the same board with a vintage fuzz face, then that is going to cause an issue because it's not just the input impedance going into a fuzz, but it also, it, you know, the output impedance. Now you're going to get a problem with that anyway, since you, if you kick on any other pedal with that fuzz, so it's just about what you want to achieve with your pedal board. Understand buffers are fantastic if you understand how to use them properly. Um, and it, if it's something that you want to use in your rig, awesome. So it's not about, well, is this, for me, it's not about, well, is this the right buffer? There are, you know, there are buffers and there are buffers, of course. It's about, it's more important to understand how to use them and how to get consistent results with it. Yeah, yeah. And it's a pain. And the, the more the more you um, think about it and the more you sort of intellectualise it, the more you think sod this I'm just going to stick one on the end <laughs> so that it's consistent and that's what it always does but yep. I just don't I never I never like the sound I never like the sound it's yeah <laughs> it's it's really interesting or I do like the sound for some things like that's the thing isn't turn it? down strap clean gotta have a buffer yeah but absolutely flat out SRV craziness I don't want it there yeah yep. so yeah um, so just quick mention to Simon who's um, having a problem with his uh, neck that keeps changing relief 
Um, even though it, the guitar never moves out of his home environment and it just keeps oh, moving. Wow. He had it plecked and it just keeps moving. That is a pain. I had a GNL ASAP that did that. It was just, it just couldn't stay stable. Wow. I don't know why either. I mean, one, Tricky. Would, one would assume there's light changes in humidity in your room unless you've mm. got it um, consistently humidified. And it's worth saying, the last few weeks in the UK anyway, I don't know where you are, have been really dry. Um, I got lots of my guitars that don't normally have a problem, like the frets are all poking out the end of the fingerboards. Oh, yes, I've had that. Because it's been so dry, yeah. so that might yeah. be part of it. But um, other than that, um, yes... BV tells me that I have missed a few texts from Super, Miss Super Chats. We'll, we'll answer them as the first port of call next week. Um, sorry we didn't get to you. Um, other than that, we've gone way over time. Uh, yes. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you indeed. It is my wedding anniversary. We're supposed to be having dinner, so I really do need to go. Yes, home. yes. <laughs> what time is it? Um, 20 to 8. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, that was that was fun. Um, <laughs> we will. Uh, it's a show this week on how heat affects transistors and affects your fuzzers. So that it's is hilarious. It's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. So join us on Friday, and then we will see you on Monday uh, for VCQ, and we can all have a chat about our experiences with fuzzers in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Groovy. Brilliant. Uh, au revoir. Tout le monde? Indeed. And here is that 